Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening. We're live. Weather Brains episode 949 for the 25th of March, 2024. <clears throat> Glad you're here. Going to have a really good show tonight as we look back on a very historic weather event. And we're almost at the 50th, 50th anniversary of the super outbreak of 1974. Goodness, I'm burping here. Don't need that. Got to get these, uh, <clears throat> got to get the burps out. All right, let's bring in the uh, guests here. This is the pre-show. This is the magical part of the program where we do three things. We share boring personal stories, humorous anecdotes, and from time to time, we say very outrageous things. And if you're looking for the beginning of the show, move the slider over eight minutes. Eight minutes, and that's when the official program begins. But sometimes if you don't, you miss the good stuff. You really miss the good stuff. <clears throat> okay. So I just got oh, a note. James? I got a note that this meeting is being live streamed. That's what I got that too. Is that bad? Well, <laughs> do, do you <laughs> think that, so? It, it says that every place. Um, hey, Steven. Or Steve. Can we hear Steve? I think he's muted. Okay. He is yes, muted he, and he, is. He probably saw the two of us and he's going to hang up on us. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Not a I, bad want, idea. I wanted to leave. <laughs> yeah, no, he clearly it's wants out right where you are, Steve. Yeah, we're in a narrow zone of sunshine. <laughs> and a little bit of. <laughs> that's what we say about the show every week. <laughs> that's a great show title, Narrow Zone narrow of Sunshine. Zone of but we cannot <laughs> use that because the um, show has not well, started you, yet. You can make an official, like, waiver of that rule. I, 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 yeah, I guess who's the executive director? You, me, I don't know. You're the, you're the King Pooba. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just, okay. I'm just the DBO. <laughs> Dr. Greg Forbes. GBO. Hello, James. Man, we got hey, some bro. legends here. Got some legends yeah. here. Greg know, Forbes on the show. legend show. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. sir. Can you hear us? I do. Yes. Loud and clear. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. You look great. Thanks. Greg, Greg, Greg is like Dick Clark. He never grows older. It's disturbing. I mean, <laughs> well, my hair disappears. <laughs> well, it's all about I, snowmobiling. I hear you do, Doctor Forbes. Well, I hear you're. I hear you're a wild man on a on a snowmobile. Well, that that too, but it's probably more the uh, the hikes that I take every day. Uh, I was I hiked one of these uh, Chattahoochee related trails around here pretty much every day. I was out this afternoon for a couple of hours. I saw. Two snakes, a uh, nesting great blue heron in a tree, and assorted other stuff. So I'll I'll post on Facebook tonight. That sounds like a good day right Thank there. You, Dr. Forbes. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it was here. good day. Sure, Jen. How you doing? Yeah. I'm doing great. Hey, Dr. Hey. Forbes, long time no see. <laughs> yeah, Steve. How you doing? All right. Dr. Forbes was a, my professor at Penn State, 1979 to 80. Um I had uh, really my first uh, severe weather course with him. Uh, wow. satellite course, you know, seems like yesterday, wow. and you haven't changed. <laughs> no. I had him. I had him for a professor as well. Um, so I I saw that you, Stephen, you went to Penn State as well. I graduated in '95. That's so very good. That, that's awesome. I'm going. Hey, hey Jen, Jen, you don't need any of those audio clips until next week, right? That's right. Uh, just, yep. Okay, just just confirming. I want to be sure we're good for now. Okay, yeah. we're good. Yeah, and you got you got new audio though for weather call, right, James? You got that? Yes, and that that that's a, a show open. Is that yeah, right? it can run uh, right after the AMS if you want. Okay. I think probably okay. the best part. Yeah, I'm gonna and, drop uh, that. Bruce in. will not join us tonight, so it'll be all of us talking about <clears> weather <throat> radio. Okay, I'm going tomorrow to. Uh, see another former student, Dr. Uh, Bill Gallus, who's a professor now at Iowa State University. I, Central Iowa is having a uh, severe weather yeah, right. conference. So I'm giving a talk on disasters at the university and then a 50th, well, some, uh, some of that we'll get at tonight, but sort of a 50th anniversary remin reminiscence of the super outbreak for their, for their conference. Wow. So, so, so you're all, 
you're all uh, boned up on this thing, uh, Doctor Floyd. Well, I, you'll I don't know about the details. The details, uh, I'm not so good at anymore. But the you know the big picture stuff, I can handle, I guess. Yeah, Steve will have plenty of details for us. I don't know. I had to review it too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we Dr. all lived, Forbes it. lived it. <laughs> yeah. You were you were in uh, Chicago, right? At that time? I was. I did yeah. uh, a lot of the damage surveys with uh, some myself and then some with Fujita. I was yeah, still down in the south in July, look, filling in the uh, damage surveys to some of the stragglers. In the summer oh. there, after the trees had died, you could really get a good uh, good view of some of the trees, uh, of the tracks through some of the forests down there then. Interesting. Yeah, even in, almost easier to see maybe than before the leaves oh, had come out. Oh, it definitely out. was yeah. easy to yeah. see the... Uh -huh. the, the forested tracks that you know it was too late to be seeing the you know building damage by then you probably don't remember but you had loaned me your copy of oh. the hawks at chapel thing years ago that's not the same one that's another well, one <laughs> it is a I've treasure, got a couple copies. treasure my copy i think joe gold may have sent me one mm -hmm. like a hundred years ago uh, we, hey, hey we, Bill, we got... Bill, real quick, uh, let me be sure I got these audio elements right. So we open up with weather, the weather band open that we always use, right? That's correct. And then we go to, let me be sure you can hear this. You've heard James say it a million times, respect the polygon yes, at Weather we Call. Hear. We call, text, and email you when you're in the polygon. So that comes after the weather band, and then we open the show, right? That's right. And then, okay. then right. we'll just do the, do the weather radio, the Midland portion, where we <laughs> normally do. And... Uh, just teasing down here in a few weeks, we'll have a Bruce Jones, Bruce Thomas, loser leave town match, um, you know, steel cage death match over weather call versus weather radio. So y'all get ready for that. Oh, man. I like it. <laughs> All right. So we're nine. We just so everybody that's on here, we're streaming live and we'll start recording the audio version at the top of the hour. That's when the local TV, uh, uh, joins us here so everybody will be on at the top of the hour so we'll start the show in about 60 seconds <clears throat> if you can guess what city i'm in james Spann, from that skyline right there uh, i don't know i have no idea mobile mobile oh. alabama <clears throat> okay so i see everybody on here except uh neil and dr golden yeah. And I resent the and email I, to him. And Ken Graham. Hi, Ken. I am joining you from Cherokee, North Carolina. Okay, Neil's yeah. out tonight. Hey, hey, you, Ken, you, Ken, talk talk with us one more minute. Let me be sure we, we got your audio okay. Can y'all can y'all hear me okay? Testing one, two, three, four, five, six. That's much loud. Better. Yeah, loud and clear. A little rough I at am the beginning, in, but it, I'm, I was a little rough at the beginning, too. Look, I'm, I'm in Cherokee, <laughs> North Carolina. I'm at the North Carolina Emergency Management Association meeting in Cherokee, North Carolina. Happy to be on. That's awesome. Wow. All right. We, we, we have an office pool um, running, Ken, to determine how old you were in 1974. So I've got six. That's the leader in the clubhouse. Uh, two two is my guess. Born in 1968. Wow, I was right. You, the, the internet is really stingy about your um, about your birthday, so that's probably a good thing. <laughs> I just don't like all the gifts, so I try not to tell people. <laughs> <laughs> Let's welcome our uh, television viewers. It is uh, the top of the hour. We have no severe weather ongoing here, so uh, we're good. Um, and well, that's interesting. That's I, a new. I don't thing. know who. I don't know who recorded. Who is uh, Williams Otter Pilot? Do we know who this is? I have no idea who that is. <laughs> is that Bobby Boyd? No, no, it's not. Yeah. Actually, oh, that's probably some thing I tried, and I didn't even tell it to do that. That's pretty cool. I found this thing called Otter, and it will record webinars and your things you're at and stuff like that. And I was about, I was about a, to boot this thing offline. Well, you can, was. you can, yeah, boot it off because <laughs> we don't need because it, it's it's recording. So yeah, we're gonna. I didn't, I didn't tell it to. Good. <laughs> I found this thing last week. It is so neat because, like, you're at a conference. All you got to do is hit the button. It totally records it, like twelve hundred minutes worth. 
and then hand you a transcript at the end. All right, like, let's get let's get this thing started here. We we are at the top of the hour, and everybody is here. I think I think Neil is out. So here we go. <clears throat> In five, four, three, two, one. Join the American Meteorological Society by becoming a member of the band. The AMS Weather Band is a global community of weather enthusiasts dedicated to learning and sharing their love of science. Visit amsweatherband.org to learn more and join the band today. You've heard James say it a million times. Respect the polygon. At Weather Call, we call, text, and email you when you're in the polygon. So in a way, we make the polygon better. With solutions for personal use, businesses, schools, pools, playgrounds, and RVs, there's a Weather Call solution that's right for you. Check us out at weathercallservices.com. You're listening to Weather Brains. They're kind of a big deal. Hey, Bill Curtis said we're kind of a big deal. Maybe we are, maybe we're not, but we're here. Weather Brains episode 949. This is for March 25th, 2024. And we're glad you're here. Got a very, very good show coming up tonight. I'm very excited about this, but let's recognize our regulars that are here. Uh, Jen Naramore, how are you, ma'am? You doing okay? I'm doing great. Yeah, good to see you. You got to be tired. I mean, you, all this work you've done, all this work is about to uh, pay off here. Yeah, it's been a lot. We still have a lot to do, but uh, I will say that we have two overviews coming out. Uh, one will come out this week. We actually got our Q and Alabama overview done, and then we're going to have the Xenia one done for the anniversary. And the guys are working hard, and it's just a, it's a lot, but uh, it, it's so important. So I'm really been excited for this show to have everybody get together and, and talk about this anniversary and the next week's show as well. So thanks for everybody for being here. Yeah, it's going to be a good show. Let's go to Rick Smith, who is in uh, Oklahoma. Uh, Rick, uh, I guess the weather's kind of calm now. You had some action, what, yesterday? Yeah, it was a busy, busy day yesterday. Had some few storms. Few storms tried to produce a tornado, just didn't quite get there. We did get one weak tornado down in our western North Texas counties. But yeah, just uh, now it's winter again. Strong front coming through. It's snowing in northwest Oklahoma, and, you know, it's it's March, so... Not March surprising. Madness, tis the season. Uh, and, and for those that are not uh, watching, for those that are listening, Rick is is sporting some Twister merch. Rick, you want to describe it? What, what do you have here? <laughs> um, it's a stylish black hoodie. <laughs> Twister's logo. <laughs> Uh, Rick, Rick, like Rick has or something. <laughs> now Rick, Rick has an NIL deal uh, with, with, uh, with Twister. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk it, about uh, it later. I, I, yeah, no, I he, care about Rick. I care about Rick. So Rick, let me know where to buy one. So I, I care about you, buddy. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, Troy, you don't you don't have one of those, do you? No, but I um I was about ten hours ago in Starkville, Mississippi. Got the chance to spend the weekend with Bill Murray and um. The uh, Southeastern Severe Symposium at Mississippi State, which James, you know very well. And Bill, I can tell you that, uh, again, the young men and women in that chapter, the students that run that conference, it was a heck of a, um, a heck of a conference. So um, there is yeah, 10 hours ago in Starkville and now I'm back yeah. here. So, yeah, there is really, really, question. really good time. Uh, I want to mention real quick, I got my bell rung. Uh, and by the way, nothing <laughs> that happened in Starkville should be any part of the show in the bill murray oh um, i'm pulling it up right now oh, so i know you, you are um you just wait I, it was it was great uh one of the folks from um from mississippi state uh gifted me the cowbell this year for mississippi state and so i'm i'm really proud of that and i just uh and and so appreciative of what the people at um uh, at Mississippi State do and what their students do, especially this this thing. And Ken, you were there a couple of uh, last year, and these kids do this on their own. Yeah. We we talk about at universities. We want them to understand the real world. Get away from campuses. Campuses are not the real world, and and they run this thing on their own, and it's amazing. So with that, Mississippi State uh, job well done. A great uh, symposium twenty two, right, Bill? Yeah. Um, yes, it was number 22. That's right. right. And um, <clears throat> they did a fantastic job, uh, the entire the entire team over there. It was a well-run organization. And, uh, Absolutely. James, James had this fancy green room. I think it was full of M&Ms. They were waiting on you to get there. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, I walked out from the green room and, you know, set yeah. you up. It was beautiful. 
Our working show title is so far as I got my bell rung. I had a feeling uh, that was going to come <laughs> up there tonight, but you know, I'll, I'll take that one. And Aggie, yeah. I'll take a Mississippi state university, uh, cowbell. All right. So, uh, let's see if Dr. McLean has one of these things. Kim, do you have a cowbell? You know, I was in line to get one. I was going to be at that conference in late March of 2020. Yeah. Oh, so much wow. for that. I, I need to get back in touch with them and <laughs> reschedule that that presentation. I was so excited to be part of the Cowbell Club, but there will be another day. I know it. There'll be another day. Your day will come and your yeah. bell will ring. But Bill Murray, let's bring in our guest. I'm excited about this show tonight. Oh, James, so much to talk about tonight and so much to show when you let me screen share later. It'll be so fun. But anyway, uh, Wednesday, April 3rd, 1974 was a, a seminal day in American weather history, especially for especially for people like me and Span, our generation. Um, we're going to all share stories tonight about the event uh, from its significant standpoint and its impact and the setup that produced it. You know, we're going to talk about the warning process and how it's changed since then and, you know, how the event itself, you know, spurred a lot of those changes that we benefit from today. So we've assembled an esteemed panel of experts to talk about the event from a professional standpoint. Next week, we're going to focus on personal accounts. Uh, and, uh, and James has set me up for a screen sharing here. So I'm going to need to do that. That's not necessary. I'm, I'm going to do, do that. And just you, no, you just, no, you just no. wait. Uh, but we're going to talk about it, you know, from a professional standpoint. Next week, we're going to focus on the personal stories. Although some of us tonight, you know, may uh, share a personal story or two. Yeah. But, you know, we we'll save those mainly for next week. Mm -hmm. um, the emotional and psychological impact on survivors and first responders and the broader severe weather community. That's next week. Uh, Jen Nairmore, you've done a great job you know, getting these legends on the show tonight. So why don't you introduce our first two legends? Or I guess we only have one of them now. We, or do, yeah. I was just we only have the, one legend now, but the other legend's coming shortly. Yes, I was. I just got off the phone with the other legend, and he's trying to get in. He was having a difficulty here, but uh, hopefully we'll get him on. But that is Dr. Joe Golden. But first, I want to introduce our first guest, Weather Brain, and that uh, he's actually joined the show twice before. The last time in 2020 to talk about the documentary, Mr. Tornado, Dr. Greg Forbes received his bachelor's in meteorology at Penn State University. He received his master's and PhD at the University of Chicago, where he studied tornadoes and severe storms under Dr. Ted Fujita. Dr. Jo uh, Forbes joined the faculty in the Department of Meteorology at Penn State in 1978, and he was an assistant and then an associate professor. He taught courses in weather analysis and forecasting, natural disasters, other topics too. Stephen and I have both taken classes from Dr. Forbes, and they it was just absolutely amazing. Um, he retired in 2019 after being the severe weather expert at the Weather Channel for 20 years. So Dr. Forbes, welcome back to Weather Brains. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. The, uh, and uh, I, too, enjoyed in the past when I was over at the uh, Mississippi State uh, Symposium. That's awesome. How's retirement treating you? Oh, great. I enjoy it. I'm not doing a whole lot of meteorology, except I do with the super outbreak 50th anniversary coming up. I do have some action over the next couple of weeks, but mostly I spend my days uh, out hiking and uh, uh, sort of picking, uh, the American picker style, looking for autograph books and things like that you know, that I collect. So so having a good time in my retirement. That's awesome. Back to you, Bill. I'm going to see if I can get our other legend on the show. <laughs> yeah, go go get that other legend. Uh, my first guest weather brain tonight is no stranger to anyone who is followed severe weather or read him as a scale discussion or a severe weather watch from the SPC. He dedicated 36 years to the National Weather Service, including 22 as a lead forecaster at the Storm Prediction Center. He significantly advanced the field with his work on severe weather forecasting and as a scale convective system motion. Uh, he even has a, a vector named after him. Uh, his contributions recognized through numerous awards and mentorships. Uh, they've all left a, a lasting impact on the on the research and operational forecasting community. Steve Corfiti, I cannot believe that I have never had you on this show, and I'm so glad you're here tonight. I'm so glad to have this opportunity. I mean, I've, I've checked in on some of the programs in the past, and I really think it's great. It's hard to believe you guys have been on, that's what, 26, 2000, yeah, 18 years. Is that right? That's pretty yeah, incredible. Hard to believe. We're almost... 
We're almost ready to vote. I think we can vote. <laughs> maybe, no, maybe. Actually, we can actually have a beer in Germany. But here we're out of luck. That's um, a testament to how good uh, how good your programs are. Excellent, excellent it, work. It's just a testament to how Span is the Energizer Bunny is yep. uh, what that is. So <laughs> he's our Energizer Bunny. But we're so thrilled you're here tonight, Steve. And we're looking forward to talking to you. So thank you for being here. And uh, finally, our other uh, legend is making his sixth appearance on the show. We're going to have to make him a robe soon. Uh, but it's usually when he's sharing earwax with some other weather brain at a national conference. Uh, not tonight. He's got his own. Uh, he's got his own earphones tonight. He serves as the director of NOAA's National Weather Service, uh, assistant administrator for weather services at NOAA, has significantly advanced our weather operations in the United States through his extensive experience, his attitude, the pivotal roles he's played. He was director of the National Hurricane Center back during those terrible hurricane seasons starting in 2020. His career is distinguished by close collaboration with emergency managers, as is evidenced by where he's coming to us from tonight, uh, in order to enhance national preparedness, innovative approaches to weather forecasting and emergency response. I hear you may even Run for governor in Arizona one day, Ken Graham. Any truth <laughs> to that rumor? It's just, just rumors. Just rumors there. You know, just, uh, yeah, can't confirm or deny that that situation. <laughs> well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. We appreciate uh, Susan Buchanan for getting on the show tonight. She's a wonderful lady and uh, appreciate her, you know, pulling you over to do this. And you got a lot of important stuff tonight. We appreciate you taking time to join us for this uh, this discussion. And uh, you mentioned earlier in the pre-show, I don't know if everybody on the show that's listening may know, where are you tonight, Ken? Yeah, North Carolina Emergency Management Association is having their conference here in Cherokee, North Carolina. So I was the keynote speaker this morning talking about, uh, didn't talk about the 74 outbreak, but talked about where the weather service is going in the future with transformation. Um, so pretty exciting, great interactions today. I've had dinner with some folks uh, uh, this this evening as well. So yeah, great to be with the burden to managers, and then I'll be in uh, Detroit at the office on on Wednesday, and then in Chicago we're going to have a, a FEMA region storm ready, so we're going to be announcing that in Chicago. So an exciting week for sure. Well, that is just fantastic. We're going to stall for a minute here and hope that uh, that our other legend will join us. Jenny, you think you'll make it, or do we want to? Do we the, want to go ahead and start he, discussing? Well, he may be in the waiting room. He said he was able to. Uh, I'm not sure if James could see him or not in the waiting room, but I'm on the phone with him. I didn't want to let him go yet. <laughs> it's a flashing light. It says legend on it. Yeah. <laughs> legend. Let the legend so, in. He oh, should be. He should be there now. Connect. Okay. This is <clears throat> this is live. Let me hang up on the phone. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way we used to do it on Google Hangouts there, Jim. That's right. Exactly. So. Just a little flashback here. I got to yeah. move the cat. PTSD right now. Just, just thinking about it. <laughs> there he is. Dr. Golden is great. Yay. To you. Hooray. Can you hear well, us? Introduce, in, introduce Dr. Golden, and then we'll get started. I sure will. So our next legend who's joined the show uh, received his BA in meteorology from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1964, followed by his master's and PhD in meteorology at Florida State. He served NOAA in a number of progressively more responsible positions during his 42.5 years a federal service in both research and operations, including forecasting. And he retired from federal service in 2005, and then he served as a senior research scientist in the Cooperative Institute for Research in Environmental Sciences until 2009. His early career began in Miami in the mid 60s as a hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. And then he pursued research interests in tornadoes and severe storms at NSSL. And I found this fascinating too, uh, Dr. Joe, you led the formation of the original Tornado Intercept Project portrayed in the movie Twister. Dr. Joe Golden, we're honored to have you on Weather Brains. Great, great to be with you, finally. We're just, we're still <laughs> digging out from a big snowstorm last night. <laughs> yes, I was going to ask you about that. How much, you're in Colorado, how much did you see? Well, I had about six or seven inches, uh, and it was well forecasted, by the way, and it was over with by noon, and most of the streets have already melted off. They had they had heavier amounts, I think, to the southwest of Denver and along the foothills. But uh, it's it's been a very very snowy spring here. We uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for being here. 
Yeah, we love we love snow out in the West. So keep it coming. So, Joe, you were so nice to me when I was a, a 15 year old kid. I wrote you a letter and said, could you send me some stuff on severe weather? And you you sent me a care package all the way across the country. Uh, one one was the monograph, the technical paper uh, on the um, on the Union City tornado and the original Doppler research. It is a treasure, and I love that. And um, you know, I, I appreciate the uh, the impact that you had on me as a as a teenage high school student who was looking for a science project and uh, ended up doing one on hurricanes that went to the international science fair. But I tell you what, I, I treasured that book and, and our correspondence, and uh, I'm glad to be here speaking to you tonight. <laughs> You're making me feel very old. <laughs> well, don't feel old because it's no. just been 50 years, you know, <laughs> not, not just just a minute. I mean, it, it feels like yesterday to me. All right. Um, I, I don't good. feel like we could I don't feel like we could even be 50 years old. <laughs> um, but tonight I wanted to kind of start by you know, getting where each of us were, you know, uh, especially our legends here, you know, where you were in 1974, what you were doing and the relevance to the event to you. Now, I know, Ken Graham, you were six years old, so don't tell me you were, you know, running a WSR 57 somewhere <laughs> um, that, that night. I wouldn't be surprised, but, you know, don't tell me that. No, no, no. My own to detect no, none, none of that kind of stuff. No, 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 none of that. Yeah, well, we're, we're I'm, I'm sure you were, you were probably um, somewhere uh, thinking about this, this for sure. But Joe Golden, tell us where you were in 1974, what you were doing, and uh, how the uh, event, you know, played out for you. I was, uh, I was working at the National Severe Storms Lab, and leading the uh, government uh, tornado intercept project there. And in fact, we were getting ready to go out. Uh, we 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 sort of knew from uh, from the Weather Service uh, outlooks that there was going to be a major event on those dates, and so we were preparing uh, to go out. We thought we might get some within range of you know of our lab in Oklahoma. As it turned out, most of them were well to the east, but. Uh, and then when it actually started happening, I mean, we were we were absolutely amazed and uh, and uh, dumbfounded uh, at how you know the widespread nature of the outbreak. And uh, we got a call. My boss uh, Ed Kessler, the lab director, got a call from Ted Fujita before the outbreak was even over with, uh, asking if uh, if Dr. Kessler would send me and maybe one or two others to help Ted survey the event. And uh, Kessler said yes. And so that's that's how it all started. And uh, uh, the next day, uh, as the outbreak was, was finishing, I think it was the next day, Greg Forbes knows the details of the history. But anyway, I deployed uh, up to the University of Chicago and that's where we all met. And that's where Ted laid out his maps on where we would fly uh, in Cessnas. Uh, Ted himself, it turns out in his uh, memoir, he recalls that he flew uh, some 10,000 miles in Cessnas and uh, we wound up with 148 tornadoes, uh, 300 deaths and over 5,000 injuries. And uh, I mean, it, we were just so stunned by the magnitude of the event that we had to wrap our heads around it just to get organized enough to go out and do the survey. Yeah. So that's a first, uh, that's a perfect segue, Dr. Forbes. I'm going to come back to you. First, we missed the Oklahoma weather legend from Tulsa, James A. James uh, wanted to make sure um, we made, got you recognized. I wasn't paying attention to who James had, who had tapped on the shoulder at the beginning there, but we're glad to have you here tonight. I wouldn't miss the show for anything. No, it's going to be a memorable one. So, so Dr. Forbes, Joe was talking there about what you were doing. You were, you know, in Chicago with Fujita, getting ready to do the same thing. Talk about the event for you, what it was like on the on that Wednesday, and then in the days following. Yeah, I was a graduate student uh, studying with Dr. Fujita at the University of Chicago at the time. Uh, he was about to get a grant to to fly in Learjet's 
to uh, study the overshooting tops up and down motion to use the, the early days of geostationary satellites. So uh, the money wasn't in yet. I was lobbying him days in advance. Oh, we've got to study this. This is going to be a big outbreak. But he didn't have the money to do that. But he did. Uh, after the fact, then he didn't have enough research money in-house to do the damage surveys. So he spent uh, $10,000 of his own money uh, for paying for the Cessnas and the and ch charting them and the pilots and the hotel rooms and the film and the film processing, etc. He, of course, did get reimbursed ultimately by the National Weather Service. But the day of, uh, we were, uh, Ed Pearl, the supervisor meteorologist, and I were uh, monitoring the weather maps, excited, of course, as, as forecasters would be, and keeping uh, Dr. Vegeta apprised as to what we thought was going on. It, the, the question that day was, how far north would the event get? Because in the morning, the warm front was south of the Ohio River, and so it wasn't unstable enough in the morning for tornadoes up in places like Xenia and, and Indiana. But the warm front raced north with a strong low-level jet, and it got unstable. And, of course, we had tornadoes all the way from even New York State and, uh, and Windsor, Ontario, down to southern Mississippi as round after round, well, three lines of severe thunderstorms wound up forming. We started then in the afternoon seeing in the crude way that we could the, those radar uh, summary charts that the big lines of storms had formed. And then we started hearing about the, the tornadoes that were occurring. Fujita, as I mentioned, was kind of running out of tornado research money. And so I was literally in a meeting that afternoon with a guy, Bob Grossman from NCAR, uh, being interviewed to be a flight meteorologist for uh, airplane flights off of the coast of Africa to study the formation of hurricanes. So had the super outbreak of tornadoes not occurred, I might very well have wound up being a hurricane expert instead of a tornado expert. But later in the day, Fujita said, I think I'm going to get some more money as a result of this tornado outbreak. And that is indeed what did happen. So uh, and then uh, by six, well, during why that meeting was in progress, Ed Pearl came in and said, sorry to interrupt, but there's a rotating cloud over the over the building <laughs> here. You might want to see this. So we all, of course, not uh, not following the safety rules we ran to the roof and got hit <laughs> by one inch hail and uh, saw the rotating cloud it got itself out over lake michigan far enough that when it did drop down a funnel it was a water spot instead of a tornado but uh, you know farther down state in illinois there were were lots of tornadoes that occurred uh Fujita called his wife, uh, Susie, and told her to collect some of those hailstones in the refrigerator. And he had cocktails on the hailstones later as he went home. <laughs> and at uh, 7 o'clock, he got a call from, uh, from, uh, from the, the National Weather Service uh, saying that, Ted, I think you're going to uh, need to be doing a damage survey on this. We've got a historic tornado outbreak in progress. And uh, Alan Pearson was the guy that was calling him from what now would be Storm Prediction Center, then it was National Severe Storms Forecast Center. And then Joe has told you some of the rest. The next day, we all gathered early to uh, figure figure out where we were going to go, what was our strategy going to be, collect our damage survey maps, collect our film, et cetera. And, uh, and then the team from the University of Oklahoma and NSSL joined us. And on the fifth, off we went as teams with our designated areas to survey the the three graduate students, myself, Bob Paskin, Bob LaPlaca, were in the Illinois, Northern Indiana, Michigan corridor uh, for our uh, team. Joe, Joe, I think, was sort of in part of the Ohio Valley team, as was Ed That's Pearl. Right. And uh, Ted Fujita took a little bit faster aircraft and zipped his way down into the Gulf Coast states and the, uh, uh, and, and the far south and, and surveyed those tornadoes initially and then as Tred would do, he pretty much then uh, double checked most of the rest of the people's work to accumulate those 13,000 miles of uh, damage survey. Yeah, it's too bad, Dr. Forbes, he didn't get some uh, frequent flyer miles for that because he, he, he would have <laughs> yeah. been racking up, wouldn't he? Oh, yeah. Uh, James A., when he got back, he turned in his expense report. How do you think that went? Yeah, it's what I said. I think they probably sent it back to him three or four times to correct some minor detail. <laughs> but hey, you know, if he would have gotten frequent flyer miles for a Cessna, he could have uh, bequeathed those to Rick. He would have loved that. 
<laughs> yeah, that's funny. Steve Corfiti, um, you know, this this event was phenomenal in so many regards. And you've gone back and analyzed it, uh, you know, extensively uh, because in a lot of ways you say it was almost four different events in one. And Steve's muted, so un unmute thyself, Steve. Now, now we've gotten it out of the way. The obligatory Zoom mute. Um, it happens every week. We need some audio. Unmute thyself. Yeah. Yeah. I apologize. I apologize <laughs> profusely. We, we, do it, even... we do it every week, Steve. It's usually <laughs> yeah. me. So, Lord, <laughs> I'll, I'll take it for the team. No, as uh, as everybody here well knows, it was as you said, really four events in one. And and Dr. Forbes mentioned certainly there were three bands, not really squall lines, but loosely organized bands of supercells, long-lived supercells. And then there was actually a fourth line, which um, while it didn't produce uh, tornadoes, it did produce large hail and damaging winds in far eastern Iowa and western and northern Illinois. Um, so essentially it was four outbreaks in one. And I think that's really, you know, what sets us apart in, in my years working. <laughs> the reason why we did this analysis, I, I was just curious, you know, what, what was singular about this event? And the other one that, that really always interested me too, of course, we always heard about growing up was the tri-state tornado of uh, March was 18, 1925. And you think there has to be something singular, perhaps, or at least that's the assumption that was convey to you know us young ones coming up that there was something unique about the the depth of the surface low or the strength of the jet and so forth and i i think the biggest takeaway after you know spending a better part of a, a year going back and, and, and doing these analyses by hand that uh, went into the the paper um the screaming message is there wasn't one smoking gun it was really a whole series of events that just acted together that uh, if you took any one of those away it would still have been an outstanding event but that's really when they're acting together i guess synergistically is a fancy word really what put it across way across the line and out there as an outlier in terms of extent aerial extent and even to this day certainly the total number of uh, very intense tornadoes f4s and ef4s ef5s or f4s and f5s as they were identified by uh, Ted Fujita years ago. So, you know, I, I wanted to look for a smoking gun and I was kind of surprised that I didn't find one. And, and it always, as a, as a forecaster, I kind of say, I was always afraid. Well, was I going to miss the big one? Were we going to miss the big one? And I didn't want to do that. And I thought, well, there's got to be something in here that's going to show up. That's going to, oh yeah, okay. If I see that again, I know what the forecast. And uh, again, it just shows you the complication with, with weather. And it goes back to chaos theory because it's never just one a uh, one-dimensional forecast, regardless of what you're forecasting, whether it's this narrow dry slot that gave us a sunny afternoon here for uh, James Adelot and us this afternoon, or whether it's a big outbreak. It's a lot of things coming together that, that set the table for those events. And I think that was the biggest takeaway, but how difficult it is, because it's a lot more than just cape and shear. It's the geometry of the warm sector and the antecedent larger scale conditions that all set that table and bring it together and, and it was kind of a, kind of daunting when you think about that because um you'd like to think that yeah we can just just dis distill it down to cape shear and walk away and your job is done and it's just obviously not that not that straightforward so steve when you when you went back because i had the hot sit uh you know noah memorandum someone gave it to me in probably late 1975 or early 1976 mm -hmm. And it mentions, you know, lifted index, there's some soundings, you know, but I never saw, and maybe you covered it in your papers, you know, what were the capes and, and, and shear values we were looking at across the, you know, the, the, the main zones of the outbreak on that day? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that too, Bill, because that was one of the motivating factors because, I mean, I, I think that's an excellent report. And as I said earlier, <laughs> Dr. Forbes I asked him as an undergrad to loan me the copy and I didn't understand a lot of it, but I at least looked at it, tried to devour it. And it just shows you. I should you point out that was before we talked about Cape and Shears as parameters to look at. Those those came across and later. That, that, that's exactly right. And, you know, I I was around for part of that transition and I, I, I'm a, a, an instructor for Penn State's online mesoscale meteorology class and I try to 
get across the point all the time that uh, CAPE only, it's great. And the lifted index kind of went behind the scenes once CAPE came along with the advent of desktop computers in the late 80s and so on. But there's value in the lifted index at the CAPE. You know, not all CAPE is created equally. But we did want to look at what were those values, as you said, aerially. What was the extent of the, the buoyancy as, as uh, exemplified by CAPE? And what were the shear values? Because, again, as Dr. Forbes said, those weren't readily. Um, and you can just look back at old SPC or NSSFC outlooks prior to roughly about 1990. And it's looking like it's coming from a different world, really, all the way up to about 1990 or so. Uh, a forecaster from the early 70s, mid 70s would find themselves at home. And then all of a sudden the terminology changed. But obviously we're just looking at the same features just with a different parameter. But again, I like to stress how important the lifted index is because basically it's telling you what is the strength in a very simple fashion of the updraft, convective updraft, say at mid-levels, 500 millibars versus a CAPE profile, which as we all know could be totally different, but you have the same CAPE value displayed. So the, the, there's information in some of those old school uh, parameters that uh, I, I think comes through with that Hoxit and Chapel um, paper that, uh, that you mentioned. Hey, Stephen, uh, thanks very much for being on the show with us tonight. Um, I guess my question is, how does your perspective of 1974 severe weather meteorology knowledge compare to fit in and compare to the evolution of that knowledge through the body of meteorology and you know, coming into this field after 1974, I think many people have a feeling that things were really primitive back then. But if you look at these severe weather outlooks, they were really good, uh, considering there was not uh, an abundance of computational power available. It's, it's a great question, uh, James. Uh, so, you know, you could probably have a whole seminar just devoted to that topic. Um, speaking of that outlook, I had the pleasure of um, emailing Roy Dara was the forecaster who issued the outlook, and um, I could share it, but you've probably seen it elsewhere posted here, but I have a copy. Um, he, his outlook basically would have been for a moderate risk, which was unheard of at that time. And uh, he actually broke it at that time. We broke the outlooks out into two 12-hour segments from 12 to 0Z zero and then 0 to 12Z the, the entire convective day. And uh, his, his outlook was superb. And, and speaking with him, he's 80, going to be 84 and he says his memory is a little fuzzy, but I thought it was, it was just fine. Um, and basically, it, it shows, in particular with an, out, an event as strongly forced in a synoptic scale sense as that one was, that you could, you know, at least get 90% of the way there, if not better, um, by applying these largely conceptual models of the way the ingredients would come together based on the, 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 the synoptic scale setup, bringing those ingredients together, which were known to be highly correlated with severe storms, even though down on the storm scale, as you implied, James, they did not understand why uh, very strong shear, of course, made for storms that were likely to produce tornadoes. I mean, supercells were known, in, in, in certainly in the literature, going back to Browning um, and Ludlum in the late 50s and early 60s, but it really hadn't been uh, carried over here into the United States very much, except in the, you know, very in the small, uh, in the sphere of storms community, the research community, but certainly in the operational world, there wasn't uh, an understanding there. So that, that blossoming of mesoscale meteorology, which the roots of which, of course, went back a decade or two earlier, which really happened in the 80s. That's when I think the, the you know, you have a, this exponential or logarithmic increase in the in the understanding and then the forecast started to get based more on a physical understanding of what's going on. But I, you know, I can certainly attest just in my short span in this, in this business was that it, even just in the last 10 years that I've seen, you know, down to the smaller scales where you've got meso beta scale, meso down meso gamma scale, storm scale, our understanding now has gotten so much better in terms of, you know, which supercell is most likely to produce a whole, you know, string of long track tornadoes versus just, well, we're going to get some from central Oklahoma up into central Kansas. And so, I mean, that, that curve, that learning curve has continued to increase thanks to the, you know, largely to the power, the combination of the brain, better brain power, more people are getting into the, into the severe weather business, but also obviously the computing power 
which enables you to play games with uh, what if situations with the different models and seeing what happens if you tweak the boundary layer SRH and change the store motion slightly, you know, what, what effects that has on low level mesocyclogenesis. But back in that time, um, the synoptic scale forcing, I mean, obviously did a decent job and you can see the evidence. I mean, the evidence is all out there for everybody to see those events, the cause of the most problem is for four couches back in the seventies and the eighties were the, um, the outliers in terms of, uh, you know, we, we would used to call them mesoscale accidents. Well, they really weren't mesoscale accidents, but what we were saying is there was mesoscale forcing that was beyond our understanding, certainly beyond the resolution of the forecast models we were using. And you couldn't even visualize ahead of time, you know, maybe there was going to be a stalled outflow boundary. There was going to be a relatively warm cold pool on the north side of that boundary. And that was going to serve as a corridor for enhanced SRH and a, and a mesocycline would get packed along it and produce. You didn't understand that, but there was that transition zone. We were just beginning to get into that idea. And so we're much better at that today. But those, those type of events, I'm thinking of the, um, oh, the June 1980, uh, the town in uh, east, southeast Nebraska, uh, that got hit by basically a stationary supercell produced tornadoes three or four or five. Um, that was Grand. That was Grand, Grand Island. Island. Thank you. Grand Island. Yeah. Right. Those sort of events. Thank you. Uh, that wasn't really Southeast Nebraska, Central Nebraska, but you know those were the ones that caused problems. They still cause us problems today, but certainly they stood out much more than they do today because those were beyond the uh, purview, if you will, or the ability to capture with that synoptic scale approach. To, uh, to to forecasting these events, but conceptual models are important. You obviously have to start somewhere, and uh, you know you mentioned the NSSFC. Before that, it was a severe weather unit. Um, it's a unique unit because no other branch of the weather service can trace itself back to uh, you know basically what amounts to data mining of the observational data to create the forecast, and that's what they were doing all the way back to the early fifties. Is they didn't understand why it worked, but they knew these, thanks to Colonel Miller and Fallbush, Major Fallbush, they understood that there were correlations. And over the years, we figured out why those correlations exist. But yeah, James, you could do a whole, as you know, a whole uh, a series of, of, episodes, of uh, seminars probably on that topic. And it'd really be interesting because I, I think severe weather meteorology, outside of all meteorology, really is a learning uh, you know, a way to learn how to use scientific data to all a society. It has application beyond just severe weather. The kind of thinking that you're forced to do quickly, either as a, you know, a warning meteorologist, an outlook or whatever, or even a, a researcher thinking about how all these forces and processes come together. And you can tell right away if you're wrong or right. If you're a geologist, it takes you hundreds of years and, and centuries. You never learn as well as you do with meteorology. We have that benefit. We can barely contribute to the benefit of all of society by you know, transferring some of this ability to think the way we're forced to do in severe weather, particularly. One quick follow-up for you. How has, and along these lines, um, pattern recognition played a huge role early in the evolution of severe weather meteorology? And it still has some factor, right? Yeah, I, I would say so. You know, I, there was a period of time I can remember in the early to mid '90s, particularly, there was kind of poo-pooed, like, "Oh, that's old-fashioned," and everybody was, you know, jumping to the you know, Cape Shear idea, parameter space, and so forth. And it became considered old-fashioned to rely on the, you know, Tech Report 200, Fallbush Miller type of approach to things. But I think, you know, if you if you get any forecaster and give them some truth serum, they will admit that's the starting point just about every forecast. You know, you get a you get a fresh look at the the latest run of whatever your model of choice is, and, and, and especially in the medium range. And you say, OK, given this antecedent conditions, what's the worst that can happen here? Do I see a potential outbreak? And that's based on conceptual models. And I, I you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that at all. I think that's all part of the building blocks into making a good forecast of anything not just in meteorology, but a doctor uses that approach if they're looking at you know, a case history and trying to figure out what ails a person. So even though it's not used as a primary, perhaps, uh, uh, thing to go, go to thing today to use as a forecaster, it's certainly in the back of everyone's mind. Thank you, James. Hey, those are fabulous questions. Steve, you mentioned that the, the warm sector of this cyclone was sort of unique. Talk about the synoptic factors that led to that and 
and how that contributed to the power of the outbreak. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the most unique aspects of that event that uh, Greg Forbes touched on was the rapidity of the evection of warmth and moisture northward from the Gulf Coast states. The, um, I, I kind of touched on the antecedent conditions just a bit ago that we were coming out of an El Nino or a La Nina pattern. And basically, you know, that was a textbook case that particular year. The winter of 73, 74 was relatively mild across the Gulf Coast region into Texas. And um, it actually shows up. I mean, I could show some graphics. I, I think they were in, in that the, uh, WAF paper we did a few years ago. Um, but heights and thicknesses were above normal for at least the previous month, the whole entire month of March across the south central and the southeastern United States. Um, the water temperatures, if I recall, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I thought the water temperatures in the Gulf might have been slightly above normal, but certainly in the mean, the atmosphere was warm. Um, and also during that period, prior to the several week period, at least two to three week period prior to three of April, um, there have been a very, uh, how should I put this, a one to two wave pattern, medium range pattern, meaning there were just the, the, the large scale pattern across the Northern hemisphere was dominated by one or two planetary scale waves. So it was largely a zonal flow, a low amplitude zonal flow pattern, particularly across the Eastern Pacific and into um, North America. And as the days, as we led up to the, uh, the outbreak, the super outbreak, um, there was in place a low amplitude jet stream. In fact, there had been a shortwave trough just two days before on April 1st, there was a sizable severe weather outbreak in the Southeast, much of the same area, the Southeast got hit. Um, I guess it was the Monday of that week. And there was yeah, some the first. F3, is that right? It was that, yeah. So, do, do you want to comment first. on that, Dr. Forbes? Or no, that... I was just going to say April 1st had a moderate sized tornado outbreak. Right. And um, that shortwave trough was de-amplifying in this large scale. I mean, there was a broad, large scale cyclonic circulation out in the eastern Pacific with, of course, the jet streak that ultimately moved inland and then across the Rockies and into the central states two days later. And so downstream, that, amp that, that shortwave trough responsible for that event, we could, we'd turn them colloquially, we call, used to call them sacrificial shortwaves, just like if you get cumulus towers that, that burn off, but they leave their enhanced moisture just above the boundary layer. So a subsequent updraft comes along and could get less entrainment. It was kind of a sacrificial shortwave trough, which produced that event. And it left a, uh, a very rich Gulf air mass just straddling right along the, uh, the central Gulf Coast region, eastern Gulf Coast region. And then, of course, when the pressure falls, a very strong pressure falls, which ensued um, in the Lee of the Rockies um, you know, a day and a half later, um, all of that moisture rapidly surged north, northwest, eastward across uh, the Tennessee Valley into the Ohio Valley. So you had a very broad, um, undisturbed, not overturned by convective overturning, warm sector that was in place on the morning of April 3rd. And I don't think I've ever seen that expansive of an unperturbed warm sector um, since then. If there's any, please, uh, you know, that certain cases come to mind. I can remember like April early April of 82, April 2nd, 82, had a significant outbreak. The, the, the Paris, Texas tornado was included with that. And, um, and there have been, I'm trying to think of the, uh, the Carolinas outbreak, March of 1984, but most of the warm sector was out over the Atlantic. I've never seen that broad a warm sector. Of course, I didn't see it in real time. I was just kind of looking at it through the, the lens, 2020 lens of hindsight and doing the analyses, but I've never seen that broad and unperturbed warm sector and how rapidly it was able to recover northward through the, um, the Ohio Valley as that deamplifying shortwave trough quickly got out of the way and actually shortwave ridging. I mean, it was quite a bit of anticyclonic, you know, upper high building across uh, the lower St. Lawrence Valley, the Great Lakes region on the uh, latter part of the second and into the third. And that's what really got that warm brought that brought that warm sector together and, uh, and you know made it what it was that's just amazing uh steve thank you for for adding that because that really i think was a, a critical component and thank you for pointing that out ken graham we had greg carbon at mississippi state yesterday and he told the students he said we all stand on the shoulders of giants and i know you would you know, would, would echo that sentiment right now as we talk to these legends in the field. 
and, and talk about how this event changed the National Weather Service. Yeah, completely changed things. I mean, Bill, you think about an event like this that, that's able to make such a big difference in an agency, an organization like ours, it did. I mean, I was trying to list down some of the changes. I think about the advent of additional NOAA weather radio transmitters, how in the 1960s, the weather radio transmitters were put in mainly for marine interests, right? Along the coast, mm -hmm. New Orleans, uh, Miami, San Francisco, New York, Baltimore. So all the earliest transmitters all right there along the coast for marine interest. So this this really was like, we need more. We need, we need to have a way to broadcast out information and warn people on these big events. So it, it was a major um, increase in your weather radio transmitters. This kicked off modernization. Think about that. An event like this kicking off the modernization and reduction of higher national weather service. That is, that's how significant uh, this, uh, this event was. So I'm, I'm listening to the conversations and, and, and listening to, to some of the, the science associated with it. But the other part we don't think about it as much is it changed our agency forever. I mean, you, you think about kicking off modernization and, and, and think about the earliest thoughts of, wow, we need to detect tornadoes better on radar. How do we do that? Maybe we should have a Doppler, right? The, the initial conversations, the development of, of the next radar, the Doppler radar, the WSR-88D uh, Doppler, being able to see winds headed towards and away from the radar, um, that type of thing. It's just, you know, absolutely staggering how it changed technology. And look at we are, you know, a lot of people today can't imagine us without Doppler radar, right? didn't have it. I mean, you waited for the hook uh, type of thing. So now being able to see that, you know, get the lead time that we do now is a complete, a complete game changer associated with that. It led to um, our, our, our agency looking completely different. You know, we, we had weather service forecast offices and weather service offices that, that didn't have the same responsibilities. And it led to all of our offices having that local warning responsibility. Think about this for a second. You think about the county warning areas across the country in the National Weather Service, those were all drawn around the radar. It was like what, what access you would have around the radar. It was really looking at how to be able to issue those local warnings, those tornado warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings, all of that uh, coming after that, uh, the 74 um, outbreak. So the structure you see today, think about it, really, really was born uh, with this outbreak and the development of the radar and, and the modernization of the weather service. That's just pretty pretty amazing, but not just the weather service. It, it reshaped emergency management and how we use the emergency broadcast system to be able to, to get information out back then on your, your television, eventually leading to, you know, the things that we have today on our phones, you know, just making sure we could get those warnings out to the, the locals. But I mean, before that, a lot of emergency management was civil defense. Most of it was civil defense and, and really looking at uh, the Cold War and, and looking at uh, emergencies a lot differently. And it ended up looking, you know, really transitioning emergency management into uh, the emergency management that we have today. So, you know, I, I look at this and I, I, I listen to this conversation, Bill, and I, I think about how uh, outbreaks can, you know, whether these big events can change everything. The 74 outbreak, changing emergency management, changing the weather service. And even later in time, you look at how 9-11 changed emergency management. You look at Hurricane Katrina, how it changed everything once again. And even uh, even uh, Deepwater Horizon, uh, a big event as well. Every single one of these big events have big impacts on how we do business. This one changed everything. And actually, it'd be interesting to uh, James, you know, talking to James and, and everybody. And, and really, I don't think there was a lot of wall-to-wall -wall type coverage ever before the 74 outbreak. And it, it, you started having even television thinking about how we could do differently um, after that and how we, we really need to be on the air more often. So I, I listen to all the science here. It's absolutely amazing. I listen to the history, but think about it from a perspective of how our government, uh, you know, prepares, how our government warns and our government recovers from these big events. This outbreak changed absolutely everything. It shaped the National Weather Service that we are today. Absolutely. That, and it really is fascinating to think of it that way. And, and Ken, you alluded to it a little bit, but I don't, people may not realize how much the structure of the Weather Service has changed since 1974. You alluded to it, but we used to have essentially for most states, one forecast office for that entire state. And then you had, uh, that was the Weather Service WSFO. And then you had WSOs, which were Weather Service offices, 
which may not even be staffed with meteorologists all the time. There may be technicians there who are running the radar. I mean, it was a very different environment. I mean, the, the mission has not changed dramatically, but it was it was different. Those, some of those small offices, and I don't know them that well enough in that area to even start spouting them off, but I know Nashville had a WSO. Memphis was the forecast office for the entire state of Tennessee, and you had Memf you had Nashville and Chattanooga and Tri Cities and uh, you know different offices. So that that was very very uh, different, and that and that has changed a lot. So it'd be interesting to you know what role that structure had in it, and but you contrast that with the products. The products really haven't changed a lot. I mean, when you look at the core products that we issue, yep. Steve mentioned the, the outlooks earlier, we've added a couple of categories, but the wording is similar. Tornado watches, severe thunderstorm watches were basically the same. And the warnings, aside from putting some bullets in there, they're very similar. So I don't know, it's, it's, it's an interesting contrast to see how much structure has changed and how much that that event did well, lead I'll to add a big couple changes. Of modifications. But Warnings. On the other hand, not so much. Hmm. I'll add a couple of uh, quantifications of that. Warnings in 1974 were disseminated by an 80 character per second teletype that clickety clack. When you had 15 tornadoes in progress at the same time in uh, the Louisville and Nashville offices, they couldn't keep up. So the local radio stations, TV stations weren't getting the warnings in time. And from a forecasting standpoint, there was one computer model, the equivalent barotropic. It had two layers in the vertical and its horizontal resolution was about 250 nautical miles. So uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it did a pretty good job in catching that. I'm serious. Nevertheless, it did a pretty good job in catching that jet stream, jet streak that dug in uh, south, uh, eastward into California, blasted across. It was like a breaking wave in the ocean uh, into a full cutoff low. And to me, Dynamics are always about 50% of the game. And this one, that came in, blasted just east of the Rockies and, and broke and kicked off all those gravity waves then that broke the cap over, over Steve's widespread uh, wading uh, cape, uh, cape uh, conditions and uh, let us have those three areas of tornado-producing thunderstorms. So uh, the dynamics were spectacular and and that allowed for it to, the storms to feed on the on the evolving uh, thermodynamics. And so I, I think now would be a really good time just to kind of go around the around the room and talk about some things that you know some of us experienced directly and some of us indirectly. Um, you know that the weather service was doing then and and how that has changed. Uh, for me, the call that Alan Pearson made to Bob Ferry and other MICs uh, across the United States on that morning of April 2nd, I think was a an, an incredibly prescient and amazing thing. Dr. Forbes, you mentioned that, that he knew from the model, even as primitive as it was, that something big was gonna happen. Yeah, my understanding is that uh, Alan Pearson called all the National Weather Service offices after the outbreak in the first and said, hey, guys, we're going to have a bad event on the 3rd. So if, if you need to do some radar maintenance, take down your radars on April 2nd, do your repairs because you're going to need them on April 3rd. Hmm. Yeah. And, and that, I think, helped set the, you know, the mood and, and yeah. set the stage for it. We had Alan Pearson and Bob Ferry. And J.B. Elliott and Jay Shelley, who worked, they were they were met techs at the National Weather Service in Birmingham uh, on that outbreak in 1974. Uh, Jay Shelley was the supervisor. J.B., who we beloved, uh, you know, and lost uh, a few years ago, you know, worked that night before and was called back in that afternoon. And he said when he walked in at four o'clock, you know, the first tornadoes were starting to touch down in Alabama, in northwest Alabama. Uh, and. The teletypes, as you mentioned, were overwhelmed. Right, of course, you know they think the you know, the communicator was trying to pull tapes from the you know the various overlays. And Jay told JB immediately, "Sit down on on the Alabama weather wire and type this tornado watch out word for word from Kansas City because they couldn't they didn't have a tape on." It. And it was that kind of day, but they were working from the Centerville radar about. 40 miles from Birmingham, 
with a rat's terminal, which was a primitive fax machine. And Jay said that, you know, the entire night was spent with grease pencils and overlays, plastic overlays, you know, laying them over those faxes and broadcasting generating warnings. James, what was the lead time on Gwen? The tornado touched down at 9.04. I think they had 14 minutes of lead time on that F5 as it moved into Marion County, Alabama. What what was the most amazing thing to me, Bill? Did, didn't that warning blanket like uh, basically the whole northwestern part of the state? Uh, th- th- this was I, I a. Could, I, I could look it up, but I think that I think that warning may have been specific. But James, right after that, you're right. There was a tornado warning. I want to say it was for 24 counties. It just mentions in there it's for the northwestern quarter of Alabama. And JB told a great story. We used to have a telephone number and I burned that thing up because it was a recorded voice of the national weather service forecaster. I was petrified of the weather at 12 years old and I'm, I'm wearing this thing out and you know, they had 59,000 calls that night to that phone number. The, what there were, there are eight local lines and four long distance and the recorded message, you know, that would, you know, the weather service would continue to shorten them until they were 12 and a half seconds long. And JB said about 930, he finally said, if you hear a thunderstorm approaching you, assume it is severe and take your tornado precautions, you know, immediately. And that's the kind of night we were dealing with. I really went to bed thinking I would not live to see the next morning. But that rat's terminal to me, James, you've always laughed about that. That was a, a primitive piece of technology, and it's all we had to go on. That and the radar phone coming from Dale Black and those operators in Centerville. It was amazing. The, the rats machine, it looked like somebody barfed on the paper. I couldn't I couldn't <laughs> see anything. I mean, it re- really, it, it looked like somebody threw up on the paper. I mean, it, it was it was so, uh, so primitive. But, yeah, those old teletype machines, I, I don't think many people – have ever seen one of these things working, but goodness gracious, uh, the, the communication technique. And JB's told the story about the communicator at the National Weather Service in Birmingham that uh, basically had a psychiatric breakdown during the middle of this thing. Um, and they they physically could not get those warnings out. And uh, I don't think we're thankful for what we have, Ken Graham. I mean, Ken, have you ever seen one of these teletype machines? Yeah, I have, and I'm, I'm lucky enough that we did the anniversary um wow has it been 20 years about 20 years ago we did the anniversary and uh jb was there with us at the office when i was the the mic there at birmingham and it was interesting to hear some of the stories and he said just that james it couldn't keep up they were trying to make the warnings large just to keep up and, and there were breakdowns in the office they just couldn't keep up with the event and, and think about how lucky we are now just technology based warnings now we're polygons right we're narrowing these warnings down better than we ever have before polygons and have that information communicated out quickly to people's cell phones i mean they're watching television so to maybe see it on television or they may not get the warning i mean it's just how much things have changed now it gets right to somebody's phone which is absolutely just a game changer to, to wake somebody up in the, in the middle of the night so yeah everything and, and we haven't even talked about the social media part of it right i mean there's nothing that can happen you can skip across the street in, in a chicken suit and someone's going to say that's graham in the chicken suit right you can't do anything anymore <laughs> without social media picking up on it so we look we, we everything has changed we take that for granted but you don't have to go back very far and it was much more complicated. Even when I began my career, we we're hand typing those warnings. Every one of those, we were hand typing every single of those warnings. So it took time to get that out. Then you ran, you printed it, James. You printed the warning out. You ran to the printer. You hope it worked. And in the radio room, then you took the, the cassette tape, a four track with a magnet of erase. You put it in there, you recorded it, then you pressed enter, right? It took. It took five, six minutes to be able to get the warning out. And that was when I started my career in, in the early 90s. Now it's all so automated. We take that for granted, but looking back at it, it's just amazing. So, so Joe Golden, talk about satellite pictures because they were fairly primitive. The ATS was there and it, you know, they, they had images, but talk about challenges. Dr. Force, jump in on that too. Yeah, you can, uh, Greg, on the technology we had then. Greg needs to jump in on this. Uh, one of the great achievements of Ted Fujita was, and he got a lot of, uh, some of his research funding came from NASA, 
to use the satellite data, which in those years compared to what we have now is very primitive. Uh, Fujita particularly identified uh, overshooting tops as being a very good signature for uh, severe weather underneath. Both, uh, he later connected it with the development of downbursts and microbursts and even tornadoes uh, in some cases of overshooting tops. But in those days, the, you know, the resolution of the satellite data was so poor. So he, he went up with his Learjet and, and would fly along some, uh, you know, on the side of some of these big uh, cumulonimbi and take uh, extensive high resolution photography. And in his memoir, he, he actually uh, has some of his best cases in his memoir uh, book of these overshooting tops and how he was able to make the linkage to, uh, to severe weather. At some point, we need to talk about the myths that were exploded by this outbreak amongst the public. And there were some, uh, there were a number of myths that were exploded once and for all. And With Kim the, Coco uh, McLean is uh, is shaking is is nodding her head positively. Just we're going to definitely come back to that, Doctor Forbes. Can keep I was just going to that. add that in relation to the satellites. In addition to that, Doctor Fujita he probably doesn't get enough credit for that, but he would take those early ATS uh, imagery about every fifteen minutes on the the active days, and then we would track the little cloud tags on satellite imagery uh, manually digitize them, computerize them, and then compute cloud track winds from that. So that was basically the show cause for the funding then for the National Weather Service and as this to be able to use uh, automated cloud tracking to as a way to determine winds. So Vegeta, that's some of the some of the funding that I was getting or until the tornado Bob Abbey's Nuclear Regulatory Commission funding aid uh, came in for tornadoes some of the stuff that I was doing uh, for some of those NESDIS grants. So Fujita, in terms of all of the use of satellite imagery in, in many ways in meteorology, he was dr a driving force. And then he would go and testify uh, to Congress as well about the, the need for these expensive satellites. Yeah. And, and Steve, did you have any comments from going back and looking at any of the Satellite imagery as you were reanalyzing the outbreak, did did anything occur to you? You know, I, we had lots of those images in the the original glossy, uh, you know, Hoxit paper, um, but you know, even those were fairly primitive. Yeah, they certainly were, and uh, you know, it's amazing what uh, Dr. Forbes and and, and Dr. Pugia were able to glean from those images. In fact, I used Dr. Forbes, some of the, your conference preprint uh, postings of some of those photographs, because they were clearer than the hard copies that we had available. I'm not sure how they got passed down through the archives, if you can call it that, of the Storm Prediction Center, but uh, there, were, there were better printings in those conference preprints, but um, you could actually see some of the overshooting tops. But hey, the biggest takeaway is, and you know, I, I'm probably one of the, the oldest that came into the satellite era because the SPC or what became the SPC had um, real-time satellite imagery and you could actually have roam and zoom capability in the early 80s with the so-called CSIS, um, Centralized Storm Information System, which is, I think it was developed at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and so I, I, I was weaned on that. And, and to me, the satellite, as much as radar is important on the storm scale, no, not to take away at all, to get that big picture approach and basically to follow systems through their whole lifespan, um, well, the Grandian approach, whatever you want to call it, the weather systems that you have to have if you're good, especially in the springtime with them driven largely by synoptic scale forcing. The satellite is what provides that key. And there's just so much going on in the satellite imagery all of the time. Um, and I, I even asked my, my kids, I'm late at doing everything. So I have kids and uh, it still range from 11 to uh, 16, 17. So I'll show them satellite pictures. Oh, can you tell me why this cloud is there? They really are interested in, in, in meteorology, a couple of them at least. And um, I said, you know, I bet you if you took this to 10 meteorologists, they couldn't figure out why that cloud band is there. But I said, it's telling us something. It's a benign weather pattern today. It's not going to do anything. But that, that feature you're seeing is there for a reason. And when I look back at those 1974 images, I realized how handicapped I would be being a child of the satellite era to go back and try, first of all, they weren't coming out in real time. 
um, talking to the uh, forecasters who were around back in that era, um, it really wasn't a couple of years later when they would get the hard copies, they would come in with a, you know, a latency of about an hour or so. And then they would actually take a photograph of them and put them up as a contraption. It was interesting, like a lazy Susan, uh, a daisy chain kind of contraption. They would take photographs of them and create these video loops. And that's what, you know, when I first started there, that was still a backup for looking at the large ships, particularly like out what was coming at the West Coast from the Pacific. Um, but they were very crude. And they still, like back in the 1974 era, you see that the, um, I guess they really weren't in, in, in Dr. Golden and, and Greg, you, you can tell me it really wasn't a geostationary satellite, the ATS. It was a geosynchronous. So there was a wobble in the way that, you know, the, the positioning. And so the, the, the gridding, the geography, the gridding was uneven from image to image. So you'd sit there and look at the loops. You had to do this with your head to try to, try to figure out what was going on from one image to the next. And so when I had those pictures that, that came down through the files of the SBC, um, it was hard to just make a poor man's loop to line them all up to the best that you could to minimize that wobbling. And so nowadays, again, we're, you know, we just have so much more information at our hands, yet we still can't explain all those features, but there's so many interesting features in those images from 19, the 1974 outbreak. Um, I just wish they were clearer so we could see really what was going on on the smaller mesoscale rather than just kind of the larger end of the mesoscale, meso beta scale. When we uh, sent out our social media post tonight, we actually got a response from Bobby Boyd, who worked the event, and I wanted to read a couple of things that he wrote. Um, and he actually has his account written out there. You can find it if you just do a quick Google search. But uh, during the super outbreak, he was one of several upper air and weather radar specialists on duty during the event. This is at the National Weather Service Meteorological Observatory in Nashville, Tennessee. He said he flew two balloons that day, 12Z and 18Z, both had minus five Showalter indices. And after the 18Z flight, I went in and worked the radar as things were starting to ignite. I recall having Xenia, Ohio on radar over 200 miles away. Reports coming in from seem like every storm on radar. We had a tally that night of 100 killed, but it turned out it was overblown. There were 55 that were killed in Tennessee. He said people were not prepared. They did not know where to take shelter. Those tornadoes seemed to be on a mission. I stepped outside once, air full of electrical smell, pungent odor. By far, it was the worst event of my career. And then he followed up with, I rarely talk about it. Getting reports of damage is one thing, but getting reports of fatalities in real time is hard to deal with as a radar operator. People were just unprepared for such an event like that. So I just wanted to share that um, for somebody who you know was boots on the ground and, and was working that event from the National Weather Service. And Kim, I know you're gonna talk about um, just the aspect of, you know, like what Dr. Golden was just talking about, some of the myths that were busted during the event. I, I do. I'm I'm very, very interested in getting to the myths and we'll get to them in a second. I, I think it's very interesting how people come to their ways of knowing about how the atmosphere works because a lot of people don't have these, you know, advanced degrees like we do. They don't think about it in the same terms or from the sky down, they think about it from the ground up. And so there's a lot of room there to make a lot of interesting inferences. So we'll come to those in a second, Joe. I, I want to ask the whole panel to help situate us. You, you've given us that situatedness from the perspective of the atmosphere and what it did. And I'd love for you to give us a little more insight into that layer, the people on the ground. So you've talked a little bit about the challenges of dissemination that happened that day, just owing to the the paucity of technology and, and how it didn't permit us to put enough messages out fast enough about all of the tornadoes individually that were happening. And I, I reflect on the fact that this was the middle of the Cold War. So, you know, we think about emergency managers being part of the warning dissemination process today and sirens at least maybe help when other things are, are challenging and emergency managers can play a part. Can you just help us to understand what it would have been like to be in the shoes of a person who was experiencing this at the time? So that email was just perfect. Um, you know, was was were, were people even warned? Like, really? Did they? Did they? How would they have received warnings? And what was public understanding of this phenomenon even like? And that will lead us right into a conversation about myths. I open this to the whole panel. I see lots of nods from Ken to Greg to Steve to Joe. 
you guys all contribute what what you think um, that was like. Well, Ken, uh, Kim, one thing that I think you realize is, and I think I'm pretty sure Joe and and Stephen and Greg, this was not the days of emergency management. This is the day of civil defense. These were the days of civil defense, and I don't think that Greg. I mean, I, I'm not sure that they were. I think they were concerned with weather, but there were other things that that they had on their mind probably as well. But um, how that changes, I, I think the the teletype stuff of which I sent you a picture, I have teletype across the room here. I've kept and I've kept for a long time, still in running condition across the room, just to have it. Um, again, I heard so many stories from people in a lot of the regional. I think Fort Worth if I remember from some other events where they were the, uh, there were three or four weather wires in Texas, I believe. And they tied those circuits together or they untied them. And uh, those operation centers just couldn't keep up with the paper tape. They could not, they could not it just piled up in the floor and it just got to be a big mess. And so, I, and we're, I mean, look at everything that's happened since then, all the advancements like, Ken has pointed out and everything else where we've come in emergency management uh, in the way that we deal with this sort of thing. But, um, but I think it's truly, um, it's very interesting to go back and look at the way this information got out and, and how the public got it. Cause we didn't have, you know, 450 channels on TV. You had three channels. If you had a, an antenna outside your house um, and, and radio stations also Jen, were much more important in those days than they are now. Much more AM radio stations. You had coverage that they dedicated. Go find you an AM radio station now for the most part, except the ones with Jen on them, that that uh, that you would get tornado warnings. So all that's changed. Is, is, there's been such a tremendous change. And, Kim, I can speak from a very personal experience because I was petrified of weather. Um, I spent a good bit of my time learning which radio stations in my area Broadcast severe weather, different disc jockeys were yep. more committed to it than yes. others. And some stations had no weather wire. And if you didn't have an old weather wire, I wasn't listening to you. And I knew where I had to shift my radio dial through the day from the, from the large stations, the late AM stations that went off the air at sunset to FM stations that would cover the weather. And when they wouldn't cover it, I'd call them on the telephone. <laughs> I was the, 12 year old, it was bugging the stew out of the DJ. Um, but I think, you know, the ones that cared, you know, really show that I will never forget listening to WFMH from Coleman, Alabama, that they had, uh, their, their studio had been hit by the tornado that moved through that town. And about 10 o'clock, they were broadcasting from their transmitter. They had a copy of the, the weather wire there and they read the warning where the weather service in Birmingham said, that there was a tor there was a thunderstorm in Marion County that had five hook echoes in it that was moving at over 120 miles an hour. Now I don't know how much of all that was exactly true, but when I heard that, I thought the world was ending. So it was a survival technique at that point, Kim, and to you know to be able to get that life saving information even in 1974. The warnings coming out of Birmingham. And I know the warnings coming out of Huntsville were saving lives that night, um, you know, because JB was asked that question by Mr. I think by Alan Pearson on that show 114. He said, JB, did you get any, you know, did you get any um, critical, you know, critical mail after the, or phone calls after the uh, outbreak? And JB and Jay both said, absolutely not. Everyone was so thankful for the warnings. And so I think from that standpoint, the weather service grew up a lot that night. And um, I'll turn it back over to you, and Kim, and any of the other panelists that want to add to that. But I experienced it directly. I was just going to comment that it definitely was civil defense, not EMA at that time. Yeah. I do, th though, think they were pretty directly involved in uh, at least the reporting and the, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the middleman to the National Weather Service of uh, when when there was damage occurring. Uh, I don't think people were directly calling the National Weather Service at the time. I think the National Weather Service was getting reports of uh, of damage from the civil defense oh, and from the uh, law enforcement. So uh, they were pretty, uh, pretty directly involved, I think. Uh, but 
maybe not so much in the warning process, but in the in the process of helping uh, with the warnings because they were supplying, you know, storm information to the National Weather Service. Yeah, there were some heroes heroes in Alabama, Dr. Forbes, like James Spann. You'll remember Spencer Black, the longtime uh, civil defense director in Limestone County. His county was ground zero in North Alabama that night, and um, he was he was actively involved in the weather process for sure. I can I can tell you that from you know reading all the stories afterwards. We can. We can get to the myth busting if you want. <laughs> you know, you've raised it. Um, it. Well, really quickly, I know, Jen, you have mentioned that you have learned a little bit from survivors that still are around today as you've gone and done your study of this event. Um, so you have a little bit of insight about what it was like to be in the shoes of some of the people who were affected by this event at the time fill in the gaps for us. What what information was available to them? It sounds like there were some broadcasters, whether on television or radio, who you could count on to be committed to this endeavor. And were people actually getting the message before tornadoes hit them? What was that like? Yeah, there, there was quite a bit that people received warnings, mainly TV or radio. Gil Whitney, WHIO uh, for Xenia. Uh, WHAS was broadcasting for Louisville. Um, WFKY in Frankfurt, Kentucky. The other thing that I noticed though, it was they were the radio stations and the TV stations were also reporting that other tornadoes had occurred throughout the day. So someone in Frankfurt may have heard that Louisville was hit and or they, and they may have gotten word that there was something else happening. And so they, that alerted them, okay, maybe something's going to come our way. And so even though maybe said there was a lag in the warnings or they didn't get it, they, they knew something else was going on in other parts of the country, whether, you know, for Frankfurt, it was Brandenburg. The other thing I noticed too, Kim, is that some folks would write their story and say, I got a phone call from my brother in Mississippi. This happened in Guin, where they said, you know, there's, we've heard that there's tornadoes coming and it's so it's the same way now. It's the friends and family phone calls, just as yeah. important 50 years ago as it is today. The uh, meteorologist in charge of the National Weather Service in Louisville was actually on the radio talking to the one of the local radio stations and saw the, uh, you know, talking about the, you know, the dangerous day. And all of a sudden he says something like, good sakes, lands alive or something like that. Uh, there's the tornado is coming. I'm a going or something. He saw the tornado touch down right over the airport there near his office at Louisville. That is so just that's a that's a pretty direct warning. That's the equivalent of yeah. the helicopter, uh, given the reports of uh, following the tornado today. Absolutely, and oh, that it is so. It's so neat to see how the human dynamics really at heart don't change. Uh, and a really interesting little factoid here. And then, Joe, I know you're so excited to talk about the myths that were busted. We're going to get to the Mythbusters portion of our show in a second. Um, something that you, you just mentioned at the time, you know, there were telephones. There was a way for people to instantaneously communicate about the tornado threat to each other and to report, oh, this is happening. And people could figure out it was sort of upstream. And we sort of take for granted that that, that happens, that we have the ability to access information like that. But it really wasn't always that way. And if you look at the tornado mortality data over time, we actually see that tornado mortality as a, as a share of the U.S. population goes down starting before there's a weather service at all. And before we have tornado warnings or knowledge of tornadoes much at all, when it starts, Harold Brooks and I, we, we sort of surmise that it's connected to when um, telephones and, and the wire were popularized in the 20s. That's when you start to see the fatality rate go down. It's when people were able to talk to each other. And it, it has more to do with humans as detectors of threat and transmitters of risk information. And it still today is an incredibly important part of our warning and dissemination process. To warnings aren't just a technology, they're a social process. And the more that we embrace that, as it has always been, the more that we will be successful. And with that, Joe, I'd love to learn a little bit more about what were the, the standing myths at the time that were popular and what happened at this event to bust them? Well, I want, first I want Greg to chime in because he saw some of the same things that I did at different locales. But 
there were myth, there was a myth that tornadoes don't cross rivers. Well, that was exploded a number of times, most uh, notably uh, west of Cincinnati, where a fairly intense tornado, I think it wound up being an F3, crossed the, crossed the Ohio River from Kentucky into Ohio. And we it surveyed became an that. F5. Huh? It became an F5 then yeah. in, in Sailor so, Park, the suburb of Cincinnati. So the river is not going to protect you if you're on the other side of the river. And the other, the other major myth that was exploded is that a lot of people thought that mountain ranges would stop tornadoes. Well, we, we surveyed some that went up the uh, portion of the central Appalachians, went all the way up to the crest, and the damage track continued down the other side. And uh, so, and of course, we've seen that a number of times here in Colorado. We've had uh, uh, since the 70s in particular, since the, since the cell, advent of the cell phone, we've had more and more and more reports of and well-documented and photographed cases of tornadoes up in our mountains, in some cases at, up at elevations of nine to 10,000 feet. In the case of the Appalachians, you're talking about maybe two to 3,000 feet. But those were two major myths that were exploded. Uh, Greg, I wanted to ask you about the big tornado at Frankfurt. I think Ted Ted did, looked at that again, and I, didn't he decide that it, it wasn't quite as large uh, as he thought it was, that it actually turned into a big downburst? Uh, yeah, let me uh, comment first on, in the mountains, there was uh, an F4 tornado at Murphy, North Carolina in this 74 super outbreak. So that was certainly about the myth of can't hit mountains was certainly disproved. Um, uh, yeah, and in Fujita, after he discovered microbursts and downbursts in 1975, he went back and looked at a lot of the super outbreak data. And uh, one of the tornadoes, I think it was maybe that Frank one, had a real wide portion yeah, to it. And two he, miles called, wide. he called that a, a downburst. Uh, in principle, that might have knocked down the tornado count by one, but he also found that the Monticello track that I had surveyed, there were some funny drift marks across that that he decided were the stop being a tornado damage marks on the ground and had become downburst. And so there was an extra tornado added then after that when the tornado re-intensified. So we wound up with a net still 148. But uh, yeah, that was uh, the downburst did some of the damage in the super outbreak, but still wound up with 148 tornadoes. Well, there was one myth that was a big one, and certainly the publicity from this engineering, engineers added their uh, two cents worth as well. A big myth was that the damage from tornadoes was from houses exploding because of the trapped high pressure air inside initially, and then the tornado with its lower pressure going over and the house would just explode because of the trap pressure. And of course, uh, this super outbreak became a, a good mechanism for getting that message out that it's the wind force lifting up the roof, pushing on the walls. Uh, if, if the tornado is strong enough, it will break the windows for you. You don't have to worry about opening them. Uh, just use the time to take shelter. There was one safety rule that came out of this that Fujita developed. Uh, the Brandenburg tornado, we talked to the coroner, and we went after the fact and talked to the coroner there to find out Fujita was interested in what caused fatalities. And I, I believe all of the fatalities in Brandenburg, or almost all of them, were head injuries. And so after that, Fujita, anytime he gave a public appearance, he would tell people, put on a helmet, it might save your life. And I, at the Weather Channel, I went, would always do that every opportunity that that I got that uh, because head injuries are so often the, the fatal ones. Good point. Yeah, and remember we uh, some of this old tornado literature dating back that point also ask people to take cover in the southwest part of their house because yeah, all the debris yeah, yeah. blow away from them. I presume. Yeah. The, the, yeah, and there was also the myth of the skipping tornado, hopping across the countryside like a jackrabbit. And having done surveys of at least 127 of the 148 tornadoes with the Chicago group there, we didn't see anything that was behaving that way. It behaved systematically. The tornado touched down. You could see the marks on the ground until it stopped. Then you had a two or three mile gap 
because of the tornado family character of things, that tornadoes evolve. Now we know that rear flank downdraft air comes in, disrupts it, and then a new one forms under the mesocyclone. Uh, but we didn't see any skipping tornadoes. We saw a, a regular behavior of the tornado and its association with uh, the parent thunderstorm. I'm sorry about that. I'm trying to be quiet while I eat over here. Um, that those are all incredible things that bring back so many memories for me, um, and and so many myths that we that we believe. You know, there there were at a, at a at a point. You know, I, I was always told that you know tornadoes, um, you know, would um, hit a, a church, but you know, wouldn't hurt a bar. You know, and it was because the bar was open, the saloon had all the doors, the windows open, and the church was tightly closed, and that always bothered me. Director Graham, you mentioned something in chat that was an important part of the weather process, the warning process then, still is today. And uh, our friend James Spann was involved that night doing this. I would assume so, we're talking so, about ham, ham radio. Ham radio, James Spann. How how important was it that night? You and the well, other army of volunteers that were helping. So so my quick story. I was working at the Tuscaloosa County Civil <laughs> Defense Office in 1974, which, by the way, was in the attic, the attic of the city hall. Now, of all the places you're going to put that thing, you put them in the attic. But that's where it was in 1974. I was in high school. I was a senior and um, uh, I was working as net control in the emergency operations center. And um, uh, the we had spotters out in the field. And quite frankly, we did not know what we were doing. It was dangerous. We had no training. It was very dangerous. But we dared. We dared. We triple dog dared a tornado to come through our network of people to get into Tuscaloosa County. And thankfully, that night, Tuscaloosa County was spared. But there were urgent calls for help from places like Jasper, Alabama and Ewan, Alabama. And so uh, it was, we were winding down operations in Tuscaloosa. They needed every ham radio operator they could to go north. And understand, this is 1974. There were no cell phones in 1974. Uh, we were it. And they sent me to Jasper, Alabama. That was the first stop. But I checked with my mom. She was a teacher at the high school. She checked with the principal, and they gave me three days to go volunteer. Three days as a high school senior. And the first stop was in Jasper and there was a police escort waiting for me uh, because they were all they were. It was pitch black. They had no power, no communication. They were cut off from the world. And until we could establish that link back to Birmingham, they were in big trouble. And uh, I'll never forget. They put me in the emergency room of the People's Hospital, which was the name of the hospital. And uh, I was busy. I was wiring antennas and, and getting everything ready. We got the link established. And let me tell you what, fellas, I looked around and also I saw things a 17-year-old child didn't need to see. I don't know why they had me set that up in the emergency room, but the graphic nature of the wounds was absolutely unspeakable, horrific. I didn't want to talk about it then. I don't want to talk about it now, but I think for some reason I had to experience that. And from there, we went to Gwin, Alabama, and I thought the world was ending. I've never, I saw damage in Brent, Alabama in 1973, the year before. That was an F4. But this thing in Gwin, I, I, I just, I, I thought the world was ending. And from there, we wind up in Huntsville. But again, it was a life changing experience for me. But the ham radio operators in 1974, they, and I'm not talking about me, but all of them were a beacon of light where there was no communication and people today can't understand that because you've got your phone here. But uh, again, uh, ham radio was a big deal then. And quite frankly, it's going to big deep be a big deal at one day, you know, when, when the big, you know, CME hits the, the, in, yeah. you know, Carrington uh, <laughs> yeah. or EMP or whatever. I mean, so there's still a need for us. Yeah. yeah that's, I, 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 I keep, I keep my license just for that. You know, I still keep my license current and still like a radio operator, been a radio operator for a long time. But you think about the space weather event that we, we just had. And I think Ken okay. just went away. I think the director just froze. 
He's back. He's back. I, Maybe. A big, big of that not knocking out. You know, it could knock out those type of things can, can happen again. It just shows how communications could fail. It's interesting. You know, I, I looked at some of the data that was deployed after after the, the events in 1974. So they, they went far and wide to set up communication networks. Um, just absolutely amazing um, how ham radio applied then and it still does today. Now think about it. 911, we take th things like that for granted. Um, did you know? It's interesting. If you look up the, the history of 911, it was Alabama in the, in the late 60s. Um, Alabama Telephone really uh, was one of the leading places where 911 started. I mean, if you think about that, but not every place had it in 1974. And then it, it wasn't until 1978 that we had naval communication direct line firms that became uh, more like EMs at civil defense. But hey, Brady, I, I tell you, that's the only way, like, Zini, uh, that had any sort of big Toronto. Uh, Dr. Ford, I, talk. I, I encourage everybody, uh, tell a friend. Uh, it's it's still valid today to have a to have it. My, I've got mine. K I E four B K. That's me. Um, Doctor Forbes, talk for a second about the scale. We take it for granted today, but it was a novel item in 1974. And when we had Alan Pearson on the show, he said that he and Fujita sat down one night over. I think he said sukiyaki and scotch and came <laughs> up with the uh, came up with the uh, scale in one night. Talk about that scale for a minute. Yeah, that's that wouldn't surprise me because uh, those two guys were, were good friends and and colleagues. Uh, Fujita and, and Pearson uh, developed the the F scale. In fact, it was an FPP scale at that time, the Fujita Pearson Pearson path length path width aspect of it. Uh, that was developed in 1971. Uh, Fujita, under research grant, uh, did some studies in 1972, I think it was, uh, looking and using it. And then the Weather Service adopted it and assigned their forecasts or assigned their offices to give their storm data reports starting in, I think, the spring of 1973 to assign also a uh, an F scale, not just report yes or no tornado and the path length and path width kind of thing, but also uh, give a, a, a an F scale rating. So officially, officially in 1974, um, the National Weather Weather Service was responsible for giving the final rendition of all the the super outbreak tornadoes. So if you look careful enough, you'll see some differences between what Fujita said. And what the National Weather Service said, including the National Weather Service had uh, seven F5 tornadoes. Fujita only had six. Uh, and the F2 and stronger and so on numbers differ a little bit as well. Uh, but uh, the Fujita developed that. There wasn't much hard data to use to develop the Fujita scale. He used a lot of intuition and what little amount of uh engineering studies had been done at that time on a few kind of objects. He just did his best estimate. Uh, my understanding uh, a little bit more of the origin of that scale, the story that I have heard is that uh, they had just developed uh, the private previous, previous year or something like that. They had just developed the Simpson Safford Simpson scale for hurricanes. And, uh, the story that I've heard is that on the way back from a flight somewhere one day, uh, Fujita's wife, Susie, asked him, why why, don't, why isn't there a scale for tornadoes? And of course, Fujita said, well, that's a pretty good idea. So <laughs> Fujita himself always gave credit to his wife for suggesting the Fujita scale. And he set about making one, uh, published it in the in WeatherWise, uh, but it combined, as, as I'm, you're probably all aware, it combined house damage and other kind of damage and trees and, and other things. And uh, starting with the super outbreak began the sort of the transition where engineers increasingly got involved in the process. Engineers, teams of them from Texas Tech and a couple of other universities looked at a lot of those super outbreak tornadoes and 
they were, of course, looking at engineered structures, concrete and steel, the school buildings and any other kind of engineered building that, that had uh, engineering plans for them. And they said, uh, even for these school buildings, the concrete and steel, we don't think it takes more than 220, 230 mile per hour winds to destroy those. The F5 there doesn't need to be 260 to 318. And for houses, they said, it doesn't take anywhere near 100, 200 miles per hour, let alone the F5, 260 to 318. So gradually over the years, as they accumulated their evidence, then in 2007, the National Weather Service adopted the enhanced Fujita scale that changes the affiliated wind speeds and uh, adds a lot more detailed description uh, to to be used to assign those enhanced Fujita ratings than were in the original Fujita F scale. Dr. Forbes, we a couple of weeks ago, we had an amazing night with Tom and Doris Grizzulis. Yeah. Um, it was it was two hours of just amazing conversation like tonight. Um, talk about the importance of his work uh, that, that you've been watching and observing and building on for the for the last 35, 40 years. Yeah, Tom Grizzulis has written the, the Bible of tornado climatology and now has come up with an updated version of that or an extended version of that. Um, and uh, huge, thick volumes or even double volumes. Uh, and uh, any time I wanted to go back and, and do some tornado history studies, I would pull out uh, his work. I, I should probably tell a little bit more to that story as well. Um, and, and we should give some credit to Bob Abbey of the then of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, because after the super outbreak in 1974, that was still a time period when the United States was actively actively building nuclear regular, uh, nuclear reactors. And they wanted to know how strong do those have to be built in order to withstand the, the strongest tornado. Uh, their intent was to, you know, to see if really you could knock down the wind speeds a little bit, more like the engineers were saying, because it cost more and more money to for every mile per hour faster you had to protect the reactors against cost at that time a million dollars per mile per hour. So a lot of the funding for Fujita's tornado climatology research, and it was also done independently by uh, by the National Severe Storms Forecast Center. They had two groups that were going back and looking at the, trying to assign old tornadoes, F-scale ratings. And then Bob Abbey brought in Tom Grizzulis to essentially be the referee between the results that were put out by Fujita's group and the National Severe Storm Forecast group. That was uh, uh, Alan Pearson's group at the time. And then after that, then uh, uh, Grizzulis has, has kept up the kept up and, and published all of his work in, in, in that he collected along the way and, and many other valuable publications that he has made uh, to to help educate the public about tornadoes. So he's both provided reference books for us experts and specialists, as well as information for the public. So he, he's had a tremendous impact on the profession, uh, both expert-wise and, and the public-wise. Well, you're exactly right. His work has been phenomenal and we just had such a great time. A few a few tears were shed that night, uh, for sure. Just uh, walking down memory lane with that wonderful couple. Um, I, you know, we kept everybody for such a long time tonight. Troy looked at me uh, in, in Starkville on Sunday and said, you know, hey, Bill, we still got to get that show down to 90 minutes, but it ain't going to happen this week yeah. <laughs> or next week. Uh, uh, for sure. But I thought I'd go around the, the table, the big digital weather brains mahogany table here and uh, ask for a memory maybe that you haven't gotten a chance to share. Uh, Joe, it's such an honor to meet you and talk to you tonight. I'll kind of let you lead off. Anything else stand out for you about the outbreak that we haven't discussed? Yeah. Uh, I interviewed a couple that were living in Xenia, Ohio. And I asked them how they got the warnings and they said they heard the siren 
And just at the moment they heard the siren, they looked out in their front yard and three of their large maple trees shot up like a rocket. Hmm. And they jumped in their basement. I mean, they literally dove into their basement and they uh, their lives were saved. Uh, the house was uh, severely damaged. And uh, so that, that told me an, a number of things, uh, the most important of which is that uh, vertical motions in these big tornadoes, particularly one like the Xenia case that had suction vortices and that there was a spectacular film taken by a Boy Scout there, by the way, uh, that, that tells me, that told me that there are very, very large uh, vertical motions in the tornado and that accounts for some of the damage that we see. Yeah, what an amazing photograph the next day on the front page of the Birmingham News from Xenia of that huge black funnel going across the town. It was um, truly terrifying. Jen, I know you probably ran across that photograph and others uh, in Xenia. You spent a lot of time there recently. Um, any, anything else you want to share from your, uh, your travels and research over the past couple of years about this day? Yeah, that, that image came from the hospital, and um, there's a, a listener of the show, her name's Tracy, that we've actually corresponded. Her mom was standing next to the director of the hospital when he took that photo, and so I'm going to talk to her a little bit more about that and maybe interview her mom as well. Um, as soon as he snapped that photo, they went they went a run, and, and it, the hospital was not hit. Uh, but it was, it was just too close. But yeah, in our research, it's it's amazing to read these stories and and to talk to survivors and the emotions that well up 50 years later, um, looking back at the impacts. And that's something we're going to touch on a little bit more next week. But uh, for me, it's just, it's been fascinating to learn. And um, I do want to give a, a huge thank you to Dr. Forbes, who has already worked with us on two of the different events and corresponded with us and given us a lot of information for both the Frankfurt event. Uh, we ran across Dr. Golden's uh, survey and, and how it looked like it was, you know, this huge tornado, this is what it was originally reported that went toward stamping ground. It was, you know, a tornado in Frankfurt, but then the reanalysis later, it was a macro burst or downburst winds and stamping ground. And uh, we were a little bit nervous about talking about that in our summary because the people of stamping ground, they are defined by the tornado at stamping ground. They have a Facebook page. They have you know, books, oral narratives, and all this stuff. And so we were very careful when we reported it in our summary series that it, it doesn't matter. It was still, it, it gave us an opportunity to teach a lesson about downbursts, that it's downburst winds can cause tremendous damage, especially something that was that huge. Um, and and the, the damage there was just as frightening. Um, and, you know, that is a case where you, if you have something like that happening, you, yes, you treat it as it's a tornado and you still do that today, whether, you know, it's straight line winds or whatever, it, it can cause tremendous damage. And so uh, just a lot of uh, important lessons and important people that we continue to, to find in along, along our road here in our travels with this event. Yeah. Uh, a, a gentleman in Moulton, Alabama, after um, the uh, outbreak in our state, went and and recorded dozens of uh you know of eyewitness narratives and i know you have a copy of that book jen it is it is one of my treasures um because the 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 terror and the fear and the dread that people felt on that day was palpable um you know i really do think everyone pretty much in alabama even if they weren't in earshot of a forecast, knew that day was a problem. It was 90 degrees in Birmingham that day. Uh, I think I think I'm right. I may it may have been 80, James Van. I may be wrong there, but the dew point was in the lower 70s. Uh, there was a, a strong southwest wind or southerly wind all day, gusting to 30, 35, near 40 miles an hour, and uh, it was just a, a, a terrifying day. But Jen, thank you for for all you've shared. Steve, your analysis of the event has been so enlightening to me tonight. I can't wait to have you back on the show to talk about your really storied career, but you added so much to the show tonight and appreciate that. Is there is there anything else we didn't get to bring out that you want to 
that you want to make sure we talk about? No, I just want to appreciate, I think, the, the work that you guys do, particularly on an event like this, the retrospective that you um, provide so to get people to, you know, for future generations just to communicate, you know, what it was like, uh, especially uh, James lived the event, you uh, as a kid, I mean, that kind of insight and, and your, you know, experiences there firsthand um, carry so much weight into, again, communicating how far we've come. Um, and then obviously, with the work Kim does, how far we can still go to better communicate the threats. We understand them a little bit better now, but it's still, it's a real problem and how you best communicate the hazard. You don't want to overwarn people, obviously, but at the same time, you want to be able to better fine tune where the, you know, the greatest risk is and to, to evoke the action uh, of everybody. So I think your, your program is, goes a long way to furthering that. Well, thank you. It's kind of therapeutic and, uh, certainly, um, I, I hope that's the message that's being received, you know, uh, in the audience tonight. Thank you for saying that, Steve. Uh, uh, James Fan, of course, it was a, a huge night for you. You've already talked about that in numerous times on the show. Um, any other things that you that you haven't thought about tonight or shared that that you could add? No, I, I just, um, you know, I think everybody ha has a moment in, in in their youth where their life changes. You, you don't even know when you wake up that morning that it's going to change your life. And and, and I, I did that all the time. I worked all kind of weather events in the 70s as a kid uh, at that EOC or whatever they called it back then at the Civil Defense and uh, had no earthly idea that that night I, I would not go to sleep. I would be headed north and not go to school for three days and uh, it's, you don't know, but uh, things happen. So that was just one of those events for me. And I'm glad we're talking about it. And I'm glad that uh, Joe and, uh, Greg and Steve and everybody else was on the show tonight, because I've learned a lot and it's, it's still to me, it's a mystery because you just can't, we, we didn't have phones back then. We didn't have all the videos and the pictures like we do today. We didn't have social media. That wasn't that, you know, that, that wasn't around and we just don't know a lot. And I've learned a lot tonight. So it's been a, a very, uh, very good show. And, I know that Jen's worked real hard on this too. And uh, we'll, I think Bill, we're going to continue this discussion next week, right? Yeah. We're going to have a great show next week with uh, some, some survivors and eyewitnesses uh, from the public. Uh, it'll be, uh, you know, uh, this was a little more somber than our normal show, but still, you know, more professionally focused next week will be a hard show. I think a lot of, uh, yeah, there are going to be a lot of emotions and, and tears. And for some people, Jen, correct me if I'm wrong, this may be the last time they talk about it publicly, you, you said. You know, they say they're going to come out one more time and talk about it. It, it hurts. Yeah, especially if, coming up to the 50th anniversary, and, and they're talking about it a lot already. And uh, it's it's a lot, and it, it's just, it just rips your heart out to continue to – it's like you're reliving it over and over again. But they – Again, there's this need to want their story to be told, and so they can help people. And so it's such a it's such a hard place to be where you want to you're trying to balance that. Right, it's and really I, really I, tough. I will say, um, April third uh, that night, I am speaking at the First Baptist Church of Guin, Alabama. Uh, and that's going to be another pretty powerful service and event, I think. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, if you would tell me as I was a kid in, in, you know, high school kid with my ham radio gear floating around there in 1974, that 50 years later, I would be coming back as a professional meteorologist to speak with these people. I'd say you're crazy as a lunatic, but anyway, it's been, uh, it's been quite a ride. So we have to break here quickly, uh, everybody. Uh, and and uh, again, for all of our guests, if you have to drop off please do that. But if you can stay for a few more minutes, we're going to uh, do a couple of quick items of business here, and then we'll go straight to picks of the week. We're not going to have any uh, audio segments this week, and we'll skip the email segment just to save some time. But we do have to take a quick break, and we will be right back in mere moments as Weather Brains rolls along. Join the American Meteorological Society's Weather Band at amsweatherband.org to connect with weather enthusiasts all over the world, plus 10,000 plus members of the AMS. Swap stories and data, join photo contests and interactive webinars, or test your trivia knowledge. Full membership is just $12 per year. And don't forget to join Weatherband February 29th and March the 1st from noon to 4 for the annual virtual Jamposium. 
As requested by Weather Band members, the Jamposium will cover topics from climate change and severe weather to science communication, citizen science, and the April 2024 total solar eclipse. Go to amsweatherband.org to get started. And uh, usually at this time, we talk to uh, our friend Bruce Jones from Midland uh, Radio about NOAA Weather Radio. This is a great time to talk about it tonight, Troy Kimball, uh, because, Absolutely. you know, in 1974, I knew of Weather Radio, but it had not arrived in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, because of the outbreak, as, as Ken has alluded to earlier, uh, you know, a lot of things happened. And for us, in Alabama, getting a normal weather radio transmitter in Birmingham uh, was, you know, another uh, life-changing experience for me uh, because I didn't have to search, you know, frantically for those warnings for any DJ that might be talking about the weather during a storm. Suddenly it was there at my fingertips. It's there today and it's even better. Uh, you know, if, uh, if Bruce were here, he would tell you, you know, a lot of us, you know, love the old live weather radio voices. Um, you know, we were talking, Troy, uh, who were we talking to in Startville that was, you know, recording weather radio carts for $3.30 an hour at the National Weather Service in Jackson? Who was that? Uh, golly, was that, uh, I think that's Bruce Thomas, right? It probably, it was, it was, it was Bruce, Bruce Thomas. Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and JB's, you know, I, then my next, you know, survival technique was to decide which weather forecaster was working at the weather service. Because if JB was on, you were going to get, you know, an occasional live break in and, and, uh, you know, frequent updates and, you know, other forecasters might not have been as diligent, but, uh, I breathed easy when I knew JB was there, but now we have, you know, an incredible system that, you know, delivers these warnings in seconds directly from the forecasters terminal right into the, the uh, weather radio and then the tone alert is there and and we can you know rick smith we we have those coded so that you know we don't have to wake everybody up in the middle of the night only those folks that want a specific warning for their county uh, that's an important difference in weather radio now and the weather radio in 1976 definitely and the radios the technology has gotten so much better to program those counties it's very easy now to select the counties you want it's not a we used to have events at the mall where we would sit there and it was a process to to program it's much easier and th that is a big difference and i still talk to people that say well i used to have one of those but i got tired of it waking me up well you you can fix that now so th the technology is there and that that's a game changer as far as getting people to use those well jen you've got a, a an email about what the radio that you've received why don't you share that, that real quick and then we'll talk about a special uh, a special offer that uh, Midland has for Weather Brains listeners. Yeah, we had the the tornadoes in Ohio. Uh, one was about eight miles north of me, uh, and one went through Delaware County. We got an email from Jennifer Pratt, and she said, "Please tell Bruce Jones that when we were huddled in our safe place with no power and no cell service, our Midland weather radio was in full voice." So that's an awesome testimony to that. That is absolutely right. I was having a birthday celebration the night that the tornado went through uh, the northern part of jefferson county a couple of years ago i i was off duty and had, had kind of unplugged after weather brains and was uh, immediately brought back to you know reality by by my weather radio sounding for a tornado warning for jefferson county and uh you know i was grateful for that because you know just as well that storm could have been closer to where we were. But James fan, we got a special offer that Midland has given us and that is 25% off if you use the code SPAN25 at their website. Uh, SPAN25, S-P-A-N-N, -N, as if there's anybody that doesn't know how to spell that anymore. But that'll get you 25% off your order uh, at Midland uh, Weather Radio. So please take advantage of that. James, these things are as important as smoke detectors. Yeah, much like a uh, smoke detector for a tornado in your home, and everybody needs one. And again, it's stunning to me how many people don't yeah. because they think they're going to hear a siren. They think their phone's going to go off, and the, you, you really need one. So again, uh, go to MidlandUSA.com and get that uh, uh, special, and now's the time to do that. All right, let's quickly do Picks of the Week, and we're going to get out of here. So everybody that's left, if you have a pick of the week, something that's interesting, that's weather-related, and uh, let, me, let me just start with mine. Uh, uh, my pick of the week, it is uh, 
the user's guide to the National Water Prediction Service. I think their website goes live soon, uh, next couple of days. Uh, is Ken still here? I think Ken had to go, right, Bill? Uh, he did. He went. He's yeah. got to meet the folks over at NCI, he, NCEI tomorrow. So yeah. he's got an but, early day. But anyway, I, Ken, Ken would know the details on this. But anyway, it's, it's very interesting. And again, that uh, so again, a, a user's guide to the National Water Prediction Service, NWPS. And again, the link will be up on weatherbrains.com. All right, Rick Smith, have you got a pick of the week for us this week? Well, 26 years before the 1974 outbreak, uh, uh, two historic events happened in Oklahoma City at Tinker Air Force Base. Today is the 76th anniversary of that uh, fateful first tornado forecast from Fall Bush and Miller at Tinker Air Force Base, March 25th, 1948. So, yeah, that's we come a long way. Red Excellent. letter day. All right, let's go to James A. before the 9 o'clock news begins. James A.? Mine is a tweet Sunday from Zach Stanford, who does pretty much everything in the emergency management GIS world of Oklahoma. And it's all it is. It's the season. Not only is the landscape greening up, but the little red dots from Spotter Network appear in Oklahoma and and pretty much define all of the streets and highways out west. And that happens Sunday with severe weather moving in from the texas panel it's just kind of neat to see and it marks truly the official start of storm season there you go tis the season all right kim give us a good pick of the week yeah i'm picking the space weather prediction center or swipsy their twitter page the sun has been very active all kinds of craziness going on it's a fun page to follow right now it is a very interesting page to follow for sure. And that, that, that cuts through all the malarkey that you hear on social media. And that's the source. And that's a great site. All right, Troy Kimmel, give us something good. Well, I've got the, I had the teletype picture and I sent it to y'all on, uh, on email. And I have no idea. I hadn't got it on my computer, but if y'all have access to it, um, just to show people sort of what that 60 or 65 word a minute, Stephen uh, teletype looked like back in those days. This one is one that, uh, a guy in the Navy actually helped me find probably three or four years ago in Baton Rouge and, uh, still operates, still sits across the office from, from where I am. And, um, uh, again, just to understand how well that didn't work in outbreaks like this. I mean, it just, it became a, a big, uh, bottleneck uh, essentially. So, that's what they look Rick, like. Yeah. Rick and they, saving yeah. the day. We, yeah, we got it. The email. Yeah. Yep. We've got it. And that and that one still actually runs. Uh, got some ham radio operators that keep it going. And I mean, I can sit there and type on it and everything else works just like it did the day it was in service. Of course, that, that brings back memories. Goodness it gracious. Does. Um, <laughs> I, I, I dreamed of having one of these in my house. I mean, it was a dream to have one of those things. You know, they had one at the e, the, the old civil defense office. Um, yeah. And, you know, I love that thing. I mean, I would That's, hover and, over that thing just and this waiting. this is what the radio and TV stations had, too. I mean, it was tied to a local telev a t a telephone exchange. It was hard wire, copper wired. And uh, that was the way to get it. But remember, it's 60 words a minute. That was yeah, it. Yeah, we, did, we didn't. I, I didn't have one at the radio station where I worked as a kid, but of course I did through television. We had one at uh, the NBC channel here. Yeah. Uh, we had one. Uh, now, when I went to Dallas, uh, we had, we said, uh, we still had it in Dallas in the mid 80s and had it at, uh, when I came back to Channel 6 here back in 89. So, yeah, that, that thing brings back very fond memories. What a great pick. Marvelous memories. All right, Jen, give us a good pick of the week. So my pick is essentially just the services and commemorations. James, as you're going to be at the one in queue, and I'm actually, Zach is going to go down there from Tornado Talk. He's going to be a part of that and record it. Since I can't be there, I will actually be going to Louisville and speaking there and also to Brandenburg. And uh, I know there are at least two different ceremonies in Xenia. So I just want to highlight those. A lot of the city uh, Facebook pages have all the information. Also, the National Weather Service are highly involved in these events and will be speaking as well. And then a lot of them are starting to do online lectures. And my link is to one from the National Weather Service in Indianapolis of a lecture that they're doing in conjunction with the Public Library of Indianapolis. Excellent. All right. So, Steve, we've stalled long enough. you got to have something good for us. Give us something amazing. Uh, a pick. This can be a website, 
Hardware, software, book, anything, something good. I don't know if it's amazing, but um, I'm interested like in old technology, everything old. It's, I'm always backward. But they're actually on eBay. Um, you can find the catalogs for the teletype machines out there if you're really interested. Um, <laughs> and so if you ever needed parts or yeah. whatever, or why it was constructed the way it is, it's amazing yeah. what's out there. So pack rats. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Exactly. That is okay. that is absolutely uh, that is absolutely outstanding. Goodness. Well, this was a this was an amazing show. And again, uh, 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 Joe and uh, uh, Ken and uh, Dr. Forbes had to drop off. But Steve, thank you for spending time with us tonight. Thanks, we appreciate your work. You're one of the legends. And uh, thanks a lot. Great knowledge tonight. Very good show. Thank you. And for those that are new here, we are typically Hello. on the No, no, no. You air. can skip by, Bill. You can, you can skip Hello. by. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Bill. I, I'm, I'm losing my mind. Y'all are going Go, I Bill. am really excited about my pick tonight. Uh, Troy Kimmel is, is one of the greatest supporters of law enforcement in America. Would you agree with that statement, Troy? Yeah. This is at and, Smithfield uh, yeah. Cafe. And, and Bill, Bill says, I want to get the picture. We're sitting at the, at the, for breakfast, what Saturday morning and, or yeah, yeah, Saturday, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, yeah, Sunday Sunday morning, morning. Yesterday morning. there is Barney there is behind him. And I had no idea, but I was so impressed. I do love, love me some Barney five. So, <laughs> so Troy's favorite uh, police officer is yeah. Barney five. Yep. So nip it, and, nip it, uh, nip it. We, it. we, 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 we had a great time in, in a start for sure. Yeah. And met a lot of great people and a lot of old friends and, uh, and, and that breakfast right there was, it was a big fun Excellent. part of it. Yeah. That, that yeah. picture will always commemorate it. Thank you, Troy. Yep. <laughs> yeah. for that. So any other news bill? You, any, would, uh, would you like here? some, some new guests or some other exciting news? Jen is in charge of next week's show. She has put an amazing show together. So get ready for that. Uh, other changes, Christina Ballantyne, uh, an incredible young woman who Troy and I met in Starkville, uh, will be coming on the 8th of, of April. Kim Cloco McLean, I'm sure you've already seen her work. Is Kim still here? She may have had to drop off. Uh, but Christina's done some great work on tornado warning visual effectiveness with broadcasters. Yeah. Uh, and so that's going to be a spectacular show. We're going to have a little uh, weather channel geek out on the 15th. Heather Tesh, uh, longtime OCM uh, at the Weather Channel, is going to join us. And uh, then the team from the Tennessee Valley Weather uh, up in uh, Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, uh, led by um, our friend Ben Luna. His entire team is going to join us that night. And uh, Johnny Parker, looking the address to the nines in a, in a black suit, uh, was at Starkville on, uh, on Saturday with his dad. We got to spend a lot of time with him, and uh, that was fun. Johnny will join us that night as the yep. guest panelist. And that's just some of the guests coming up. James, we, we got a lot of other guests that we found there. We're going to be filling out our dance card in the next coming weeks, right, Troy? That's right. I like it. I, I hate it. I missed Starkville, but uh, again, I, I had a great I time. At, uh, had a great time at uh, the Goshen United Methodist Church oh, wow, uh, wow. on the uh, 30th wow. anniversary of mm. the tornado that hit that church yep. on Palm Sunday, 1994. And uh, that right. we'll, we'll we'll talk about that another time. But it was great to see Kelly and Dale Clem back and so many uh, old friends there. But listen, we we do have to go. We we could keep this thing going all night. We're typically on the air Monday nights at uh, seven o'clock Central, eight o'clock Eastern. And if you've never done this, you can watch this live on YouTube, youtube.com slash weatherbrains. But we know that most of you listen. However you listen or watch, thank you. And if you want to get in touch with us, the email address, it is email at weatherbrains.com. So on behalf of the entire Weatherbrains crew, I'm James Spann. Thanks for listening. Have a great week and God bless. Thank you. all Thanks, everybody. Thank that was a great show. Thank you, show. Steve. Yeah. Steve, Steve, you so next week. Steve, Steve. Steve.